Well, I want to start by thanking the Zelen family. Without their support, the conference would not be possible. And I also mentioned that uh, in addition to this symposium, Thelma Zelen has also been a loyal contributor to the Institute's uh, annual giving and also has um, um, funded a chair in, in biostatistics in Marvin's name. So for those who don't know, Marvin Zelen was the founder of our department. He, when it was started, I think it was called biometrics and it was called biostatistics and it was called biostatistics and computational biology. And now we have even more of a diverse group. So we're, we expanded it in our called data science. So Marvin was, was an applied statistician. He made a lot of contributions in, in clinical design, in uh, experimental design, clinical trials in cancer, many other statistical uh, challenges. And he, um, he was a data scientist, as we define him today. He was very driven by the problem that he was working on. And that tradition lives on in the department. We're very applied. We now have um, not only statisticians working on clinical trials, we also have statisticians working on genomics, computational biologists, machine learning experts, and also uh, software engineers helping us with the implementation of all these ideas so that they're used in the clinic. So that uh, explains the, the name of our department. We have three divisions and um, that cover the, the groups that I just mentioned. So I also wanna uh, uh, use this opportunity to have a uh, captive audience to encourage you to go to our webpage. And, and if you're interested in a postdoc or in a faculty position or in a um, scientist, staff scientist position, we, Almost every year have, have uh, uh, positions available. And uh, in my opinion, it's a great place to work. So please join us. If, if, please go look at the opportunities if you, if you get a chance. All right, so just a note, I also wanna uh, explain a little bit about what the symposium is, is, is about. So every year we, we pick a theme related to data analysis and, uh, and, we, we, make, and we do a conference, so it's not, it's not uh, always related to cancer research. We, we try to be more broad and try to learn from others. So in the past, if you have followed us, we've had one on machine learning. We had one on, 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 the, on the 2020 theme. And this year, uh, with the help of Alberto Cairo, who is one of our speakers, we, are, uh, we picked the theme of data visualization, which to all of us, all of, all of us who do data analysis, is, we all know how important it is. It's, Without it, we would be making a lot of mistakes. We see how models don't work when we look at data. Um, we design models based on what the data looks like. And we also explain our results using uh, data visualizations to try to convey the message as best as possible. And today we are gonna hear experts that focus on data visualization. So I'm very excited to hear what the newest things are. We're, we're, I think everybody in this room is a user of data visualization, but our, our speakers are innovators and developers of, of, of the methods that we use. Okay, so uh, before I introduce the first speaker, I, I don't wanna forget this. So I wanted uh, everybody to help me in thanking Erica and the staff for organizing this very complicated event. Okay, and our first speaker. He is Alvita Otley. Um, Alvita is an uh, assistant professor in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering at Washington University in St. Louis. Dr. Otley's current research interests include information visualization, human computer interaction, and visual analytics. Previously funded by NSF and US Army, her research pursues areas such as learning and modeling user behavior, individual differences, and personalized health risk communications. Her work has been published and leading conferences and journals such as CHI, InfoViz, FAST, and TVCG. And today she's gonna to talk about the case for precision visualization. Uh, thank you, Rafael. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. My name is Alvita Otley, and I'm an assistant professor at Washington University in St. Louis. I do quite a wide range of research, but today I'm gonna to be talking about uh, something that has been puzzling me for a few, about a decade now. So almost a decade ago, I began to observe something that made me question everything I thought I knew about data visualization. Uh, specifically, I stumbled on this problem where it's notorious that people have difficulty reasoning with it. And so I designed it as a study. I gave half of the participants some text to reason about data. And I gave another half the text with the visualization to reason about the same data. 
and I found no significant difference between them. So this is where a case, this was a case where visualization didn't help. And uh, I thought it was a fluke, but a few months later, another paper came out that essentially said the same thing. So they looked at text and they compared it to six different visualization designs and found that visualization had no me measurable benefit in speed and accuracy. Uh, so why does this matter? It matters because this is Bayesian reasoning and communicating Bayesian reasoning is important for medical decision-making. Uh, take this for an example. If a woman at age 40 receives a positive mammogram, what are her chances of actually having the disease? Another scenario where all of us can probably relate to, if you get a positive result for a COVID test that only gives a false positive one in every 1,000 times, what is the chance of you actually having COVID? It's not 99.9%. Uh, you can't really figure this out because I didn't give you enough information, but people make decisions like this every single day and struggle with these decisions. And you see this all over the news, like for instance, when the pandemic just started, uh, there, there were some labs where there's some labs that got like lots of false positive tests. There was Ohio governor that got a false positive test, two false positive tests actually, and then got a PCR test and it was negative. And like you see it all over, all over with um, false positives and false negatives and people struggling with and understanding these statistics. It turns out that doctors also struggle with this. So this is a really great article um, from the Washington Post and there are lots of other research studies out there that shows that doctors are surprisingly bad at reading lab results. Uh, the problem is so bad that a few, actually back in 2015, the American Cancer Society, they changed their recommendations so that women don't get a mammogram starting at age 45, but instead, from age 55 because of all the false positives and all the, um, on all the overtreatment related to uh, breast cancer. But why is this so hard? Is it because people are not very good at reasoning about probabilities, especially when they don't have statistical training and when the consequences of their decisions are really hard, are really consequential. And so when we went into this, we wanted to figure out, can visualization help? So after I saw that fluke and I also saw like the follow-up study, I decided to look into this a little bit further. Specifically, about 10 years ago, we ran a study where we compared text only to text plus visualization. We had other conditions where it's just a visualization alone and no text information. We had a condition where we had text and visualization, but we were like, we were trying to break the visualization down so that we were explaining to them. And we use this visualization because there was this prior work that showed that this specific visualization resulted in uh, very high accuracy, very high reasoning accuracy. But if you look at this as well, we believe that we believed that visualization would have an advantage because you can come in with your own perspective and reason about the data. So for instance, one person might look at the entire population and then look at the amount of people who have the disease and then reason about those who um, test positive given that they have the disease. Another way you can look at it is you look at the population and you look at the people who test positive and then reason about people having the disease given that they tested positive. So we thought that visualization should help, right? So we ran these six conditions, varying text and visualizations, different combinations of text and visualizations with 377 participants. And we also measure this thing called spatial ability. I'm gonna to touch on that a little bit later, but we did this on Mechanical Turk. And overall what we found, and so here on the X axis, we have all the six visualization conditions. So all the, all the six tests and visualization conditions that we looked at on the Y axis, there's accuracy, so higher is better. And it turns out that we didn't really see lots of differences that we expected to see. The only difference that we saw here was that text only, so one of the conditions with text only and the storyboarding condition that interleaved text and visualization, there was a significant difference between them, but there were no different, significant difference between the other conditions. It turns out that, as I said, we also tested spatial ability. And so spatial ability measures uh, how well you can mentally manipulate objects. And so for instance, if you can look at these, if you can try, if, you, if you're good at figuring out which one of these patterns can be folded to make the square on top, then it's very likely that you have good high spatial ability. It's A by the way. 
So it turns out that when we started splitting the people, splitting the data by spatial, spatial ability, so we separated people based on the median split of the spatial ability scores, where we have low spatial ability here shown in light blue, and we have high spatial ability shown in dark blue. It turns out that we saw a significant difference between the low and the high spatial ability folks. Um, some of the interesting things that we saw was that for the low spatial ability, there was nothing that was significantly different from text. And for high spatial ability, we started seeing some interesting patterns. Here we saw that the best performing uh, representations are the one that had either text only or had visualization only. So people really struggled when you had text and visualization together, even those with high spatial ability. Uh, so, but overall, it made me realize that you were asking the wrong question. The question wasn't really, can visualization help, but who does this specific representation help? And so there are lots of things that have plagued me since then. One of the things is that for low spatial ability, it seems like nothing really helps them. But then also for high spatial ability, you had this really fascinating phenomena where you had text and visualization together and they seem to have this, um, this, conflict, this, this, this conflict between them. And so we weren't the only one who saw this. The other, another study like looked at this, saw that when they removed the numbers from the, visual, from the text, sorry, when there's text and visualization, performance increased. And then we saw that with, with visualization alone, performance also increased. We ran another study where we looked at interaction to see if interaction can help people uh, can help people uh, when there when there's text and visualization together because there's a lot of previous work that suggests that when you have some linking, uh, then people are better with reasoning with text and visualizations when they're together. It turns out that that didn't help. In fact, when we looked at people with high spatial ability, interaction made them perform worse. So we run another study again. So this is our most recent work where we looked at both text, we looked at text by itself, text and visualization again, and visualization by itself. But we started to look at uh, like different ways of thinking about how to measure people's performance. So instead of just looking at speed and accuracy, we started looking at other types of individual differences. So we looked at working memory capacity and the working memory capacity uh, it measures how many objects can you essentially hold in your working memory. So here's an example of a test we gave people, borrowed from work by Lace Padilla and, uh, and her team. And so we gave someone like an image, we flashed an image, say for instance, a rabbit, and then we gave someone a math problem, we flashed another image, an umbrella, we gave them a math problem, we flashed another image, a star, we gave them a math problem, flash another image, and then we gave them a math problem. And at the end, you needed to recall all of the images in that order. And so this is an example of a four span. So we did four span, five span, and six span, and essentially measured how well people can remember objects. And then again, we separated people based on the median split of, this, of these scores, low versus high. Another thing that we looked at was uh, something called a NASA TLX. So we wanted to measure workload, but we we were doing an online study, um, direct ways of measuring workload, like um, includes things like uh, FNIRs to some extent, EEG and so forth, but we didn't have very direct ways. And uh, the best thing we had available to us is this tool called NASA TLX. And it turns out that if you ask people about their workload, there's a really high, strong, uh, there's a strong correlation between their actual workload and their subjective workload. And so we asked a series of questions related to their mental demand, their temporal demand, how rushed did they feel, uh, their performance, how successful they think they were at completing the task, their effort, uh, whether or not they felt like they, they had to uh, work really hard to accomplish it, and their frustration, how insecure, discouraged, or irritated they felt when they were completing this task. Again, when we compared text to visualization to VisText, and this is a slightly different way of representing the data, we're here looking at exact answers. So how, 
uh, when did they get the exact answer, the proportion of people who got the exact answer. We see a slight difference here, but there was no significant difference, again, between text, viz, and viz6. So this is, this is not really surprising because we've seen this over and over again. We also looked at spatial ability and it replicated what we found before, but I wanted to focus a little bit here on working memory capacity. Again, I said we split people based on high and, working, high and low working memory capacity. So in green, we're seeing the low perks, in, in, in orange, we're seeing high, and we see not all of them, but some, we see a slight, a slight difference where people with high working memory generally do better, but there was no significant difference between when they got uh, this text and when they got this, but we saw a significant difference when they had texts. It turns out though that the most interesting results to me was the NASA TLX results where we asked people about whether or not this was mentally demanding for them. And it turns out that for, we didn't really see any significant difference if we just asked them if it was mentally, demand, if it was mentally demanding to them. But when we digged a little bit into the data, we saw, for instance, that people tended to feel stressed and uh, irritated when they got text. They were more likely to say that with text. And so here I'm just showing you an example from the folks with low working memory capacity. And uh, surprisingly, they were less likely to feel stressed and frustrated when they got the visualization and the text together. Uh, it was surprising to me because our running hypothesis is that the text is really hard for people to understand. If you add visualization to it, then that's even harder. And you add interaction and all this stuff to it. What it, what it does is like, it just makes it really harder. And it turns out that like I was again wrong <laughs> about something. Uh, so here, what, my, what I think is happening here is that when you have text and visualization together, people tend to choose the representation that best align with their way of thinking or the best they feel more comfortable with. Uh, that's not really grounded in any kind of evidence. Uh, we need to do further research to better understand that. Uh, it turns out that we saw a very similar thing with uh, people with low spatial ability as well, where this plus text was, uh, they felt that they were less likely to feel insecure, uh, discouraged, irritated, stressed, annoyed when they have this. And so like, here's now another indication that maybe this is a way to go. And uh, what's interesting about this is that if you look at a lot of the previous research on individual differences, we tend to categorize people as those who are good and those who are bad, those who visualization help and those who are not, who, who, who they don't help. And it turns out that that is really a very flawed thinking. And it just turns out that we're just observing a very specific, a specific, very specific set of visualization. And uh, it could be that there are other representations out there that are better suited for specific groups of people. And so the, what I'm really arguing for here is that we need to a better way of understanding how individual differences impact reasoning with visualization. This is, out, this is even beyond uh, medical decision-making and Bayesian reasoning. So essentially, like similarly, similar to how we might personalize medical treatment with precision medicine, and perhaps then we need to think about how to personalize how we present data to our patients for medical decision-making. And uh, I'm a little bit early, but that's it. Thank you.
hard to do. It's hard to direct people. It was difficult to pre-specify. Given the situations where why you're in situations, pre-specify. So just to repeat a question for the folks online, uh, there are, it's essentially trying to figure out what is the best way for thinking about personalization. Do we test people first and then give them the right visualization for them? Or do we perhaps have a way for them to pick which visualization is right for them? Uh, it's a complicated problem. And I've been thinking about this for a long time because this isn't my only work in in the personality and data visualization. Yeah, so there are like, sorry, I did a survey uh, about two years ago, and there are a lot of data, a lot of individual differences that would impact the way people use data visualization. So in some cases, it's possible to pre-screen someone. Like for instance, I have collaborations with the DOD. They have lots of information about their analysts. So pre-screening someone makes sense. I've also had, like, I, I don't know how often this is, but I've, I was talking to a colleague who uh, works in the area of diabetes and they know a lot about their patients. And so they would customize the types of conversations they would have based on educational level. And so like, in some cases, yes, that's the case. I'm also working on adaptive visualizations as well. And so perhaps we can observe interactions. Some of my research has also shown that I can observe how people interact with the visualization and predict their personality traits actually. And so there are cases there where it's adaptive, but essentially I don't think there's a one size fits all solution to, to any of this. Thank you so much for your talk. It was very interesting. Thank I was you. wondering because most of the visualizations that you showed us and the examples were um, pretty basic in terms of visualizations like uh, proportions, et cetera. Did you also uh, kind of like replicate this in more extensive visualizations, such as like genomic visualization, where you're trying to show a lot at the same time versus text and see how there's still that same disparity? Or how does that work for more complicated um, problems and visualizations? Thanks for your question. So I didn't test the comparison between text and visualization, but some of my work have looked at hierarchical visualizations and has shown that depending on uh, uh, this measure called locus of control, which defines, uh, which describes whether or not you feel in control of external events, this trait actually predicts how you would search in a, a, in a hierarchical visualization. Unfortunately, I don't have any, any graphics for that. Uh, there's another study that we ran with army reservists, and they were looking at a bunch of corpus, a, a large data corpus, and it turns out that this trade again, locus of control predicts how they were searched through this corpus. In fact, <clears throat> it is probably more likely that the more complex the task is, the more complex the visualization is, there are more opportunities for us to see individual differences. So somebody in our virtual audience asked, in addition to spatial ability and working memory, what other things we, should we consider for personalizing visual representations? So right here on the screen, uh, these are all the data, these are all the individual differences, all the different traits that people have looked at and have shown evidence to impact data visualization use. And so you have the big five personality traits, locus of control that I just, <clears throat> that I just mentioned, this measure called need for cognition, spatial ability, perceptual speed, uh, visual and virtual, virtual, visual and verbal working memory and associative memory. This is a little bit of a follow-up. Do you have an idea of how representative your sample was? Like what kind of sample that, that was compared to like the general population? So the work that we reviewed, they do it, it's a it's a wide range. So there are some people who saw it, of course their first set of studies were done with Psych 101 students, for sure. And they're not representative at all of the general population. But we, uh, we've been working to use stuff like Mechanical Turk and Prolific. And uh, those, and so for those who don't know who those are, what those things are, these are um, crowdsource platforms that allow us to just um, capture a wider range of participants in our studies. So we've been using that. 
uh, one could argue that they are also still not representative because there are lots of people who don't sit on their computers all day. Uh, so, yes, it's, it is a hard problem. <laughs> Uh, thank you for the wonderful talk. I think we're all you're familiar with uh, Duft's ideas of information density and X-ray and such. So my question is, based on your work, do you see that maybe in some circumstances for some people this could actually, following these principles, could actually be detrimental for them? Can I ask a clarification question? Uh, what what might what do you mean by this principle? Uh, highest information density possible, no extra ink. Basically, what Tafti is uh, writing about in his books. So, so yes, uh, there are definitely people who don't do well with high information density uh, data visualization. In fact, we did a study with some uh, prostate cancer survivors where we were trying to develop a data visualization tool for help with communicating between a doctor and a patient. And uh, of course, for those who don't know, people who are diagnosed with prostate cancer are usually older men. And yes, when we give them really complex visualization, like some of them are like, I'm, I'm old, I don't wanna look at this. And so very simple visualization was best for, was really best for them. And so, but I feel like that's in line with what I'm trying to communicate here as well. Like this is, these are, this is another type of individual difference that we need to think about. So age might be a factor, cultural differences might be a factor. And so essentially the take home message here is one size fits all isn't the solution. So, thank you very much. All right, uh, next speaker is Jeff Hare. Um, he is the Jared D. No Endowed Professor of Computer Science and Engineering at the University of Washington, where he directs the Interactive Data Lab and conducts research on data visualization, human-computer interaction, and social computer computing. Jeff is a, a co-developer of D3, which is one of the most widely used frameworks for interactive data visualization tools. I, I bet everybody here in this room has seen something built using uh, D3. It's ubiquitous, even though you might not know it. It's definitely um, perhaps I, the majority of interactive um, figures I, I see. So re, Jeff's research papers have received awards at the premier venues in human computer interaction and visualization. He's also a co-founder of TriFacta, a provider of, of interactive tools for scalable data transformations. And today he'll be talking about authoring, visualizing multiverse analyses. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you, Rafael. Great, thank you. Um, so yes, I'm Jeffrey Hare from the University of Washington. And over the years, my group's been interested in a number of projects and supporting many aspects of the data analysis life cycle, everything from data transformation to visualization, which led to tools like D3, Vega, and Altair. But in recent years, we've been interested in trying to support uh, aspects of statistical modeling as well. And so I'd like to share just one aspect of that today, which is a project led by Yang Lu, along with Alex Kale, who's actually advised by Jessica Holman here as well, as well as my faculty colleague, Tim Altoff in data science. And the topic is authoring and visualizing multiverse analyses. And by this, I don't mean physical theories of parallel worlds, nor do I mean like the latest uh, comic superhero movie. Um, but rather um, a recognition of the fact that statistical analysis often goes along branching paths um, that we often want to account for, not just a single path of analysis, but rather uh, a multiverse of decisions. And so as I think many of us have all experienced firsthand, producing reliable analysis outcomes is challenging, even for seasoned experienced analysts. And I think a key reason for that is that there's a lot of flexibility in analytic decisions. So how do we collect our data? Certainly, but even with that, how do we operationalize it? What sort of data cleaning decisions do we make? What are various modeling decisions along the way? And so we tally these all up. There's this multiverse of potential um, analyses. And this has been likened to a garden of forking paths by Gelman and Loken. So drawing on um, allusions from Luis, um, Jorge Luis Borges. Um, and so, you know, we might explore multiple paths, um, but if we only selectively report one, perhaps one that has our most desired outcome, there's a, a variety of pejoratives for that. Um, but let's just say, you know, this can obviously inflate false discovery rates. Um, we might instead try and judiciously choose a single path, and we might pre-register that and analyze that. 
But that path may still be arbitrary in the sense that there may have been many other reasonable analytic decisions that we could have made, but we're not assessing the robustness or sensitivity of our analysis to those decisions. And this has been nicely illustrated in a series of many analyst studies in which you take the same data set and the same hypothesis to test or you know, estimate um, and give it to different teams, um, all of which are very experienced and see what you get. Um, and you get back a diversity of results. Um, you know, maybe different methods, uh, different choices that sometimes can re flip the sign of the effect, not just its strength. Um, and a follow on study you know, um, of these outcomes uh, by Zilberson et al. found that these variations were not well explained by expertise, prior beliefs, or peer reviewed qualities of these different analyses. So we can't just simply say, well, one al analysis is clearly better than the other. What's that? Um, well, if you believe in the wisdom of crowds, it might. We have to go back and check. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you can if you do, um, you know, simulation-based um, studies. Um, I think they use real-world data in this case. So, yeah. Um, so, researchers have proposed an alternative, which is multiverse analysis, which is you know, before conducting analysis, try and outline a space of a priori reasonable paths. So, basically, document the decision space as you're figuring out what you're going to do in your analysis. Then analyze these all in tandem and then interpret the results collectively. So that's sort of the big picture idea uh, with the hope being that you could end up with more robust results where you can kind of uh, analyze the sensitivity of some of these different decisions and also be more transparent in reporting. But do we just take one hard problem and exchange it for a harder one? Um, well, perhaps conducting a multiverse analysis is challenging for many reasons. And for now, I'm going to focus just on some of the structural reasons and just actually executing these studies and making sense of the results. So one, authoring a multiverse is complex, right? A traditional analysis might be a sort of a single analysis script, whereas a multiverse analysis has many forking paths. And so we might write lots of different scripts, but obviously that would be a nightmare to manage. Or we might have another software anti-pattern, which is lots of nested for loops and if branches on them, making it hard to maintain and probably increasing the chances of error, among other things, in our analysis pipelines. Um, but even putting that aside, then interpreting the results of all these different analyses is itself obviously a key challenge. We might want to ask questions like, what are the most impactful decisions that were made in the analysis? And so, um, you know, Early pioneers in this space have uh, created some different representations for trying to reason about multiverse uh, results. Um, so here's an early result that uses a table. So in this case, the rows and the columns both correspond to decisions. Um, so you have to know something about the structure of the decisions to interpret this table. And in this case, it's filled in with p-values, and you can see it kind of colored based on significance with an alpha level of 0.05. And you can try and make sense of the results. But I'd argue that still it's here maybe difficult to understand, well, what decisions are the most impactful and even more difficult um, to assess you know, uncertainty associated with different outcomes. And also, are there any interaction effects among some of the different decisions? Um, an alternative visualization is called the specification curve. Um, and in this case, what you're seeing along the top panel here is basically all the different output effect sizes sorted in increasing order. So you see these different effects. And then below that is a matrix showing a different decisions and then basically colored in with dots um, where particular options within a class of decision was made. Um, I think this is a useful visualization, but nevertheless, some of those same challenges persist. We don't have a good view of uncertainty and understanding things like interactions between decisions, again, remains rather elusive. And so um, Yang and our team um, has been trying to explore both tools and methodologies for aiding uh, multiverse analysis. Um, that resulted in a, a collection of tools that we call BOBA. So maybe like the, the different uh, balls and BOBA T being the different universes um, uh, that you might want to explore. And these are tools for both authoring and visualizing multiverse analyses. And so to give you a sense of this, I'm gonna dive in and walk through an analysis scenario. In this case, um, this is drawn from work in the area of human computer interaction. You can imagine someone's developed a new reading interface. They try to improve like the speed with which people can read content they presented on a web page. And so we want to test this prediction, you know, is this our new designed web page reader view um, improving reading speed versus the traditional website. And so we can think through our analysis plan and we want to ensure that our conclusion is robust to different decisions. In this case, we can identify a variety of decisions, including both data preparation choices and different choices of model, um, including, you know, which um, devices we might filter out, um, you know, from our study to maybe get rid of outliers, et cetera. 
So that with that in mind, we can then go ahead to try and specify our multiverse. And for this, Boba provides a DSL, which is a domain specific language. We're trying to document the decision space um, of your analysis. And so here's a basic overview. You can see some different blocks uh, with different types of variables. And I'll walk through some of these in more detail shortly. And then from this, we can take all the different uh, permutations that are possible um, and then run that through a compiler that then generates all of the corresponding scripts. Um, so for example, if we zoom in on a, a simplified example of code, um, we can see analysis source code. In this case, it's um, agnostic to the underlying language you use, for example, R or Python or something else, you can write code. Boba provides annotations for basically how that code is going to get split up into multiple files. One simple example of this is a placeholder variable where we just say, here's an enumeration, a discrete set of possible things to try, and we could just take cross products of those. Um, so in this case, you can see those variables and then the allowed values that they could take. We also have a more structural component. So then we have these code blocks that are annotated with labels. And these allow for more elaborate logic. So we can have different blocks of code that might um, be, one might be evaluated or others. And we can actually have dependencies among these. And so in this case, we'd actually generate um, the following files corresponding um, to this various um, set of decisions um, in our analysis. So for example, in one case, we see uh, one of the placeholder variables put into the script. Where in the other case where we're using a mixed effects models instead of just a standard linear model, um, then we might have different choices of random effects that we might include here. And of course, those decisions um, are dependent on the fact that we're within the block um, that involves a linear mixed effect modeling approach. So again, we have these dependencies along our analysis path. And there's more details on this language and code available online. But in the interest of time, I'm gonna move right ahead to what I think is the more interesting part, which is an, um, the visualizer for trying to make sense of the results of then running all of these scripts in parallel. And so with those results, we can then load them into a visualization system um, that provides a workflow that after authoring, we're gonna do exploration of the data. And then as we'll see, we'll get to a final inference step as well. So bringing the data in, we first have this density dot plot. So each dot here is one um, point estimate of the main effect of interest that we want to visualize. And we can see the distribution and the spread here. And we can also um, select individual dots and see the corresponding uncertainty. So in this case, probability distribution functions associated with the estimate of that uh, particular uh, parameter. We'll get to that. Great question. Yeah. It's a lot to show. We have to break it into a, a linear chain here. Um, along the x-axis here, um, this is showing the magnitude of the effect. And then the y-axis, of course, is a count. So this is just a density dot plot in terms of the blue dots. And then here we might notice, for example, um, that there's two different clusters. And so this is something we'd like to explain. Well, you know, for example, what decisions are leading to this variation across these different um, variants of our analysis? And so for that, let's turn to the graph on the left here. Um, so this is a graph representation of the decision space. This is being automatically synthesized based on the annotations that we had in that domain-specific language. And so we see sort of the order of our decisions uh, within the script reflected from top to bottom. And then we can also see dependencies. So in this case, um, light gray arrows um, basically show ordering, whereas these dark arrows are basically showing hard dependencies in terms of decisions that can only be reached if you made one, you know, choose one option within an earlier branch. And so we then of course wanna ask questions like, well, what decisions led to variations in the results? And so, um, for example, we can see these are nodes are colored so we actually have sensitivity statistics and there's a variety you could apply, but in this case, we use a case samples Anderson Darling test if you're a statistician and you care to know that um, to drive the coloring here. And we notice that this device variable, which is one of the choices of um, values that were filtered, um, you know, stands out as perhaps the most sensitive. So to learn more, we can turn to interaction. And as we click on nodes, we actually create a trellis plot showing us the conditional distributions um, for the different options uh, for that decision. To try and assess interactions, we can also shift click, in this case, up to two at once um, to then basically further trellis the plot along both X and Y and see some of those subdivisions again into those separate conditional distributions. Okay, and then moving along, let's get back to our original question. Um, we might say about um, the device. Um, we can say, you know, what decisions you know, might lead to negative outcomes? We see that some of the effects here are at zero or slightly below um, within this cell. So we maybe like to learn more. Um, and so again, what decisions might lead to these negative estimates? We can go ahead and select those. And as we do that, we get some highlighting along the bottom here. 
And so this is an option view, which is showing that for the selected values, what are their corresponding proportions amongst the different decisions that we made? So in this case, you can see that these negative values are predominantly coming um, from one model. And then I can't even read this, it's so small. Um, uh, two fixed conditions here. Um, and so that way you can start to identify maybe which specific options within the decision space are leading to these, these negative outcomes, which are kind of outlying among some of the others. So we've seen some of the different tasks that we can perform with this UI. So one's just trying to gauge the overall robustness, like do our estimates cluster or do we see multi-modality like such as we see here? And we can further dive in and start to explore the impacts of decisions. But there's more that we'd like to do as well. We also like to consider the sampling variability. So we can get back to Raphael's question now, which what's that, that gray background? Well, that's the aggregated uncertainty uh, for each one of these things. So it's basically not just the point estimates, but what's the spread of possible estimates um, given the sampling uncertainty corresponding to the different parameter estimates here. Um, we can also um, change the representation. So if we want, we can actually view this in terms of probability distribution functions for these different effects. Um, or we can also look at, similarly at the um, cumulative distribution functions as well. And so, for example, we notice in the bottom right, um, you know, a higher variance uh, than for some of the other conditions, which may be um, useful information uh, to note as well. But we additionally want to consider model fit quality. Um, we're seeing some differences in variance, and not, probably not all of these models are, are um, you know, equally promising. Um, and so we'll go ahead and we'll color. So in this case, we're um, coloring by a model fit quality statistic. In this case, it's a normalized root mean squared error calculated using a five-fold cross-validation. And then we're using that to color, which shows us which of these models have a much better fit to the data in terms of its predictive accuracy uh, than some of the others. And for example, you'll notice that, you know, in the bottom right, um, this is the color scene, um, in the bottom right here, you know, there's a much paler color, which is not only is there higher variance, um, but there's, there's um, clearly poorer fit here as well. Um, but we might want to dive down even deeper. So as we select individual points, we can then look at um, predictive model checks as well. So on the right, we have the observed outcomes in terms of the actual outcome of the model, not just the estimated effect. Um, alongside the predictions that the model produces. And here we'll notice that, you know, there's not a very good match in terms of both like the, the location and spread of the different predictions. Um, our models in this category are not doing a very good job. Um, and to clarify what we've done here is we've clicked one model and that's the first you see in this panel on the right. And then we find some of the most similar models um, for comparison and they're shown um, in these other plots below. And that's what you're seeing again here on the right. And then we can compare that uh, to some of the models in another condition. And you notice that then the predictive checks show a much closer agreement than in the previous group. So if we want to, one option is also to further prune the space. Um, and so if we have um, a meaningful means by which to do so, we could actually um, remove some of these um, poorer fitting models from consideration here. Um, and that brings us to a final step we'll consider today, which is then how do we then perform inference? I wanna start making stronger claims out, is there or is there not a reliable effect here? Um, so then we can go into an inference view and it first warns us um, that we should not be engaged um, you know, in um, multiple hypothesis testing. And so that as we go from this, you know, like our exploration is done and we're going to move forward um, with our inference. Um, okay, so we, yes, we go with that. Um, and then first we get a result basically with two distributions here. Um, so one is showing you know, the, the aggregated effect across all universes compared to a null distribution. We're basically um, created by a permutation where we're basically removing any association between variables and then using that um, uh, to develop a null distribution for comparison. So we can of course look at um, the difference um, you know, in between the, the modes here uh, as one measure of the effect. And then of course, uh, the corresponding spread so we're kind of, kind of engaged in sort of a visual reasoning form of hypothesis testing, you know, as we look at this here. Um, we also said, well, how do we account for model quality that we just talked about? Well, one is we could prune the space if we have a, a reasonable kind of pre-specified condition. Um, but in addition, we can apply model stacking, whereas that when we're calculating this aggregated result um, for that final distribution, we'll actually take model quality into account um, as we average uh, the different universes together. And then finally, we can also scroll down and see a variant of that specification curve I showed earlier, 
where in this case, you know, each point is the uh, point estimate of, from, of the effect from each individual universe um, compared to an uncertainty interval, in this case, a 95% confidence interval for each null distribution. So you can see whether or not that point estimate lies within or outside that 95% confidence interval and see how that plays out across all of the individual universes. So another way of trying to assess uh, the robustness of the effect. Um, yeah, and so then this then provides us to this mean for inference. So with that, um, I'd like to wrap up and share just a few more reflections uh, on experiences we've had um, kind of working on this tool. So the first is uh, we've applied this to a variety of case studies. So first, taking a number of multiverse studies that have already been performed in the literature and then replicating them. And another case, actually working in a large collaboration on a new multiple analyst study and then using BOBA as a tool for meta-analysis of the results that came out of that. Um, and some of the findings that we found was that uh, BOVA's sensitivity to model quality and showing uncertainty uh, provides it, um, particularly useful advantages compared to some of the existing approaches and techniques. And that we're actually able to, I won't go into the details, but suss out some nuanced differences uh, from what prior analyses have found. Um, we also found that the workflow that um, has been proposed in the literature may not really work out as well in practice as one might hope, where one is supposed to, as an oracle, come up with a set of what are all reasonable, but exclude all unreasonable study designs a priori, and then analyze just those. Whereas in BOBA, we added this additional step to the workflow where there's this exploration involving considerations of uncertainty and model quality that then might allow people to further refine. Um, and you might even imagine as a pre-registration specifying, like, am I going to use model stacking as part of my inference or am I going to apply a quality cutoff um, and have some you know, predetermined notion of how you might um, formulate that? Of course, that may vary based on, on the domain and the particular um, specifics of your, your analysis. Um, but of course, there are many challenges um, that I've skirted over. So one obvious one is scalability. As we go from a single script to running hundreds or thousands of scripts, obviously the latency and the computational resources will go up tremendously. And so one thing that we've looked at is actually taking a progressive approach. So we actually sample from the universes and then show um, not just a, a kind of a, a progressive display of the, um, the cumulative effect, um, but also the decision sensitivity. And we've often found that with only about 20% of the total universes, you can reliably distinguish um, the sensitivity in terms of which decisions are the most influential on your results. And you can also do useful things like catch errors or failures to converge, et cetera, as this goes on, and then make um, appropriate adjustments as that happens. I'd also note um, we're running all of these scripts in an embarrassingly parallel way. So you can imagine um, a systems approach that finds, um, is more specific to an individual programming language find shared um, chunks of work that are repeated across universes and getting additional savings by doing that. But I think the biggest challenge uh, for folks who want to engage in this as a methodology is identifying what are the appropriate decision points. And this is hard because it requires obviously the domain science of knowing what are like reasonable operationalizations and data quality uh, approaches. Um, it also requires um, statistical know-how and like what are meaningful alternative modeling approaches that are also reasonable to test. Um, so we actually did a number of interviews with analysts where we've created uh, diagrams like this documenting their decision process and trying to understand how they go about that to be able to provide guidance in the future. And, and some ideas that remain to be explored might be more collaborative approaches such as in those multiple analyst studies and rather assuming that one person is going to know it all, how can you bring teams of analysts together to create more effective multiverses? And others are interested in maybe having um, computational assistance. So how might, for example, um, you know, algorithms that can reason about statistical models perhaps suggest um, meaningful alternatives for you to try. So that's another area for future work. Um, but with that, I want to wrap up um, and just summarize by saying, you know, multiverse analysis is sort of a newer approach to try and expand how we approach a single analysis, really hopefully improving its robustness of results um, and more transparent reporting about the various ways this analysis could be approached. Um, and our work is research software, but it's available for use. And we'd love your feedback if this is interesting to you. You can um, find the source code on GitHub or install it. Um, uh, BOBA is a Python program, but then it just processes text in R or Python or any other programming language, and then can execute those programs and, and launch the visualizer for you. Um, with that, I'd like to acknowledge all my co-authors and um, collaborators again, and take any questions you might have. Thank you very much. Hi. Um, so maybe I'm having some issues uh, differentiating the software and the application. 
Can you explain what would be the difference with uh, workflows like SnakeMake, Nextflow, other tools that are out there onto which you could do your visualization? Sure. Some yeah. So there's some different components here, certainly. So um, I can I can help clarify that. So one is just running well, first is specifying and then running the multiverse. So I think the, the hardest part is, is in the specifications, like what are all the differences? But if you have a workflow system where you can set up different forks and then have it run all of that software, um, that would be a perfectly fine alternative. Um, but the one perhaps significant difference would be how aware is that tool set that you are documenting a decision space and then leverages that metadata uh, to guide the subsequent visualization and the analysis. So for example, in the visualizer, which is a separate tool, you could produce output that the visualizer could read and put that in. But part of that is they see that documentation of the decision space to do, among other things, create that graph that's actually documenting each of the different decisions, how they're related procedurally, and then using that as a tool to both kind of filter and, and dive in and, and partition the data in various ways. And so um, short version is a different workflow system could be absolutely fine, um, but it may lack some of the useful metadata documenting the decision space um, that really we found is uh, significantly aids uh, the subsequent interpretation of the results. Uh, thanks, Jeff. This was really fascinating. And also having thought about multiverse um, authoring and visualization, I think like a lot of these challenges you're talking about are really critical, like helping people reason about like, what are the important decision points? Mm -hmm. um, I had two questions related to challenges that I don't think you mentioned. Um, sure. One thing that I always think of with a multiverse is like how you then communicate it to your readers becomes really important. So, you know, I've seen a ton in my research how people suppress uncertainty. Yeah. And so like often, you know, you give them a single analysis and they still find ways to sort of just like tune out all of the uncertainty or all of the, the variation. And so I'm wondering when you like, have you thought about, you know, what, what should someone who uses this tool then put in their paper? Um, because I think it's easy to give people just something else that they can apply some sort of simple heuristic, like, let's see, you know, did it majority of the time, was this a significant result across all of these paths? And yeah. is that really what we're shooting for? So other yeah. question is just incentives for authors, because again, for authors, like there's a lot of complexity and extra workload and having to define or specify one of these. And so kind of a related question. Yeah, yeah. Well, the incentives one's a whole can of worms we can get into. <laughs> um, but in the first case, yeah. So uh, granted, what I show was primarily focused on the analysts uh, or analyst team trying to make sense of their own data. That said, um, the inference views at the end are also intended to be the kind of thing you could put into a paper. I mean, they're presented big, but you obviously you could resize them and include both, you know, a distillation of the results almost into here's a single effect, but still trying to maintain, um, you know, some of the uncertainty associated with that. Um, and then of course, if you're really interested in like, well, how many of these universes gave me the p-value I'm looking for? I mean, that the bottom plot kind of gives you a, a variant of that. Um, and then, as you well know, but I'll say for, for the benefit of the audience, you know, others have looked at ways of pre, uh, presenting multiverse analyses kind of in a step by step way where I imagine you're reading the paper, but it's say online and the chart is actually changing like every second you're seeing a different result. Um, this is a technique called um, hypothetical outcome plots that Jessica and others have um, helped to popularize. Um, and, you know, um, um, Pierre Dragasevitz and Matt Kay and others built a, a nice system where they prototype this as a kind of concrete way of experience the multiverse by like paging through each particular outcome. Um, and so that's another way that people have explored uh, of presentation. Um, I also think just that that initial dot plot of effects, um, you know, appropriately chosen along with the, the uh, background um, aggregated uncertainty um, can be a useful display that I can imagine in papers as well. As for incentives, um, obviously that's a, a bigger socio-technical question. I think part of the goal of projects like this is to reduce that difficulty of specification to help you know, remove that as one um, negative incentive. Um, but, but ultimately, I, you know, I would hope that people would be incented, at least some in the community enough to be some standard bearers. And you know, if they find this useful for creating more robust results um, and more reliable science, you know, I hope that that would uh, percolate through. I'm not a naive optimist, but I do think, you know, that there's a, a vanguard of folks who would adopt it for that reason. I have a very quick question from the virtual audience. Um, can Bobo work with SAS? I haven't tried it, <laughs> um, but yeah, I think the only question would be if there's issues with um, um, the interpretation of comments, but if, if the SAS code is textual code that you can write in a file, then it should work. Um, let us know if it doesn't, and it would probably be um, on our end, probably a more minor modification necessary to make that work. 
Um, where we would have problems though, I would say that's for the workflow part, the DSL, um, for computing the um, visualizations, a number of additional statistics are calculated. And so right now we kind of insert kind of our helper libraries that we've built specifically for R and in, in Python to work there. Um, it could work for SAS, but it would probably require some, um, you know, reading in of the SAS output and converting it in a form that we could say, for example, run um, the R code that we have. So there'd be a, a little bit of a hurdle there. Um, so in theory, yes, in practice, it, it would probably be annoying. Yeah. <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Our next speaker is Amanda Cox. She's head of special data projects at USA Facts, a nonprofit that tries to make government data more accessible. Well, like many of us, she's a statistician. And in my opinion, one of the best I've seen at communicating statistical summaries um, from graphs. So if you ever wonder, um, why the data plots shown in the New York Times are so good, or were, maybe were so good. Um, it's because Amanda is, is partly responsible for, for all those plots. She was um, she spent almost 17 years at the New York Times, including a decade on the graphics desk, desk and six years at the edit, as editor of the Upshot. So on, on election nights, for example, we were all looking at graphs that she, she conceived. And today she's speaking, well, she's telling, about, she's telling us about the end of an era. Uh, so, uh, as Rafa told you, uh, I spent almost my whole career, my whole adult career at the New York Times. Uh, when I agreed to give this talk two years ago, uh, I was a New York Times employee, uh, and, and I left a couple months ago. Uh, I've been building a new team, I've been hiring, uh, and so, so I have no work to show, um, which is a problem for a visualization talk. Uh, and I thought how I solve that today uh, is... Uh, the very first talk I gave as a Times employee uh, was at a couple miles away at Harvard about 15 years ago. Uh, and it was a pretty good talk. Uh, child me did a good job, I think, uh, was maybe smarter than adult me in some ways, uh, and, and laid out uh, three questions. Um, you know, for our work, for the type of work that we were doing at the time, uh, what is the right level of abstraction? How do we turn uncertainty from a uh, weakness into a strength? Uh, and then some ideas about story and doing more than just saying like, here is some data. So I thought what I would do today uh, is revisit those and see like, did I actually learn anything or maybe, maybe not, maybe not. Um, so the first one, abstraction. Um, I'm sure I was thinking about stuff like, you know, like Scott McCloud has presented from his work in comics about like, is there ways that you capture more of the universal when you actually lose some detail? I was thinking about stuff like, this is a piece from my colleague Graham Roberts at the Times uh, who spent like days or weeks rendering this violin. And I was like, why don't you just take a picture of the violin, right? <laughs> um, but uh, it's great. Uh, in my own work, I was doing stuff like this at the time. That's a, a plot of, of oil prices and consumption. And I like this one in particular because uh, when we made this one, uh, it was a weekend and a copy editor called and said, I'll give you another column. I will cut the words from the story if you can just stretch it to get rid of that loop. Uh, and that was a big deal at the time that like a word editor was like, I will get rid of the words, right? Like it was like a generous offer, but also clearly said like, I don't understand what's going on. Or So, you know, I was thinking about like this level of abstraction uh, is maybe not exactly like it's possible that we have we've gone too far. Uh, and I was inspired by some of the work. This is the next example. Uh, this is a, a chart of whales feeding. This is my colleague, Jonathan Coram's interpretation of that same chart. Um, and you can see in some of it, some of it, you get it right away what it is. But I think the real stroke of genius in Jonathan was to say like, I will use the space to show you the stuff that you already know. Like I don't have to cut the axis. I can show, you know, it's boring to you if you're a researcher, if you study it, you're like that, those 400 meter, meters of that dive is boring. Jonathan will say like, no, actually, if you're coming to this new, like having that like new basic stuff helps with the intuition right away. And I thought about that a lot in terms of like, for a while when I was reading the Times, uh, I was highlighting the facts that were actually new to me. Uh, and it's a fun way to read the paper. It's a fun, uh, and then the, news, the newspaper. Um, 
uh, in part, I think my advice often for academics is that like, just like whatever you are doing, like make it so much more boring for you. Like, you know, dial down the new lever, right? Like because the newness, uh, the newness is fun. And so I think the work at the times, a lot of the stuff that we are proud of, I think is about dialing down some of that abstraction lever. Sorry about that. Yeah, so I think we've been successful. So where I was going uh, with this example of like dialing down the abstraction, uh, this group is a group that some professors assembled that represents America. You can kind of think of it as a poll in some ways. Uh, and, you know, I think it's kind of fun to just scroll through the faces and think about like, this is what America looks like. Um, but there's also, there's part of this that is one of my favorite uh, and if, if you look at it, if you look at the actual, uh, the detail, there's two women named Sharon from this small town in Vermont. That's like a population of, of 5,000 people. And you're like, there is, there's no way that's true. That is like just a correction, uh, you know, right? Like uh, that is like, no, like that's just a mistake uh, that our photographers made, except it is true. Uh, and that these two people, these two women named Sharon from this small town in Vermont were actually part of this poll. Uh, because the people who were trying to assemble these, uh, they were doing some complicated stuff to try to ensure as much participation as they could. So they would knock on people's doors and the story that they're proud of is someone said like, I can't come to your weekend to be part of this like representative group of people. I have to milk my cow. They said like, we will milk your cow for you, right? And so it was a complicated cluster sampling of where these people come from in the poll. I think when you dial down the level of abstraction, like one of the benefits is you start to be able to ask questions about the data that you couldn't have otherwise. So this is like pushing that to the far extreme. You don't actually need to photograph the people in your poll, but when you do and you look at the names, uh, when you get to the rawest level of detail, you start to think about things in a slightly different way. Different example of, of playing with abstraction. Um, this is one where uh, the yellow dots are white boys and the black dots are uh, blue dots are black boys, all of whom grew up in rich families. So they're all raised in the top quintile and then it tracks their uh, income uh, when they become adults, when they're around 30 years old. Um, and if you watch it, you can see that the wealth is doing a better job of, of sticking uh, for the white boys uh, than it is for, for the black boys who end up sort of divided into each quintile almost as if, if at random it's, it's less Protective, less protective. Uh, where this one comes from, as we were talking about this and we were looking at different types of, you know, the sort of work from the paper, um, the, you know, you charts like this, or we could chart it like this, like this. And none of those feel intuitive for the metaphor. The metaphor that we're getting at there is really, it's about children climbing ladders. Uh, and so I think the thing that I have learned about abstraction uh, in my career, and you know, at the times when we were making work for the general public at large, was that it's probably like, more concrete examples than I would like help, but the data visualization that I really love uh, is taking advantage of something unique in that data. Like it can still be abstract and be successful. Like I think there are dots, uh, you know, in, in this example, it's just points and lines and dots, but it's capturing the structure of the data. And that's my favorite data visualization is data that captures the structure of the data. Uh, uh, the second question uh, that I, I, I posed at the time is how we turn uncertainty from a, a weakness into a strength. Uh, at the time, especially, the bar was super low at the time. Um, I think more often than not, when we tried, like it was just outright wrong as opposed to good, uh, you know, and so you get things like this where you stick a, a polling footnote on a bar chart where the polling footnote doesn't apply to anything because you're only so, uh, showing subgroups, so it like is actually more harmful than not. You get things like this, where it says confidence intervals are 95%, which even if you forgive the fact that that doesn't make any sense, uh, like there are no confidence intervals to be seen anywhere on this chart. Uh, so that's not helpful for sure. Uh, so the bar is super, super, super low. And these are not like examples for, this is like the typical representation of that time too. Um, and so I came from stats. So I thought my, my contribution to the world would be improving this. And it turns out it's too hard. My contribution to the world will not be improving this. Um, but. <laughs> Uh, part of where I learned, you know, some of my, my hardest fought lessons and stuff in this, like Rafa said, was like election nights. And so I am fascinated by the idea that the most popular night in news, um, I don't think it's a secret to say that, uh, at least most trafficked, 
uh, it's a stream of meaningless numbers, right? <laughs> like uh, this is a stream of like election results playing out in Pennsylvania um, a couple of years ago. Uh, and this is Carl Good, an, an artist and uh, an educator uh, in Michigan, like teaching you about some of those. And I think AI is good enough now that I think it would be fun to just have like live drawing election night, right? Uh, except we know, we know we can do better than that, right? Like if you actually know things about geopolitics and what's been reported and what types of votes have been counted, you can do better in essentially trying to make those lines as flat as possible, right? Like as trying to say like, let's just get to the answer that you care about as soon as you can. And so often when I explain this, I show an example that uh, we did in 2014 in Virginia. We know a thing you know, learned to know about Virginia election results is there's the Democratic leading counties around DC, super slow counters. They're always going to be the last to count. And so we said like, okay, uh, if we know that, we can do better. Um, you know, we can do things like uh, uh, we, can, we can do things like give you an estimate of what they mean if we put them together. Uh, but these lines, right, like they don't, they don't really, they don't feel like something, right? Like they don't really take advantage of what's unique about the data in certain ways. And so, we, you know, the question we are thinking about, like, as we present these kind of models, these fuzzy models, where we're trying to just make the lines as straight as possible to say, I know there's uh, democratic results from around DC coming because they just haven't come yet, right? I don't know exactly what they're going to say, but I know something is coming. And so we, the question is, how do we, how do we present that? Um, you know, we, this is a sketch from 2016 that I'm super glad we didn't use uh, that uh, kind of a, a biblical metaphor there about, you know, seeing through the glass darkly, the idea being like, you know, a picture would fade, you know, it's probably Clinton, but it could be Trump or it's probably Trump, but it could be Clinton, you know, and at some point in the night, it would just become like a perfectly clear picture. Um, we didn't do that one. Uh, we chose, uh, you know, implementation that looks more like this, which when I still watch it, uh, I still still feel things uh, from this one sometimes, uh, except, uh, and this isn't uh, what we showed on election night, but this is what people remember from what we showed on election night. On election night, uh, you know, what we are actually showing uh, was, was, was more complicated and had more depth. Uh, but the lesson that my, my colleague, Gregor Eich took from this, uh, was he, his, his takeaway is there's no soft display of uncertainty. Right? Basically, like you can't give me like confidence intervals tucked subtly into the background and expect it, expect it to be a win, right? Like there's no, and I took that, that lesson away. The other lesson I took away uh, is that the words that we join to it is super important. Uh, and so, you know, in, in previous further iterations of this, uh, you know, we started making 300 row lists of spreadsheets about like, how do we describe, you know, we talked about the words this morning about how do we describe what these numbers mean. The other thing I think I learned about uncertainty is that sometimes that we can get too caught in this like confidence interval type world, which is just a fake world. And I learned that about, about being important with words too. Um, this is an old one from like, it's, it's jobs day today. Like sometimes people, when they want a toy example for uncertainty, they pick at, pick at jobs day. But this was one before a presidential election where you said, here's a basic straightforward chart. You look at it all the time. You know, if you want to put on your democratic goggles, you can look at it this way. Uh, you know, uh, there's been 31 months of job growth. Unemployment rate has fallen 2%. Uh, if you want to put on your Republican goggles, you can say, look, the economy needs to add 150,000 uh, jobs a month just to keep up with population growth. And uh, the unemployment rate has been above 8% for a long time. And that, I think, is a different type of uncertainty than the type of uncertainty that we usually talk about. But all of the things that we usually talk about are really proxies for this larger idea. And I think that, that the, and those words are super important, too. The last question I had was about story. Um, at the time, you know, the most serious work I think was happening in print, uh, but the web was new and it had these new tools and possibilities and, and, and things. And so, uh, you know, we're making things like electoral explorers, which is essentially just interfaces for data about like just a lot of, and you could kind of feel, 
you could kind of feel the era coming where I called it like the, the here is some data era, right? Uh, and I knew, knew that was bad because I knew the analogies wouldn't hold up, right? Um, you know, if you just stuck out, like here are some words on the top of the New York Times, I would say it just looked, it just feels so, it felt so wrong, right? Or, or even in the web, like the web version of it, like felt wrong too. But we were making interfaces for people who, you know, may or may not have wanted, uh, wanted interfaces. But uh, it seemed like the possibility was there, and you know, so there's this era of like, how do we move beyond the here is some data. Uh, part. And part of like, the answer I thought of it was like actual good visualization, visualizations that reveal something. Uh, for a ton of time, uh, in talks I've talked about this one, uh, from, this is the Democratic primary from forever ago, but so this is Clinton versus Obama. So that is, you know, Blacks were more for Obama, whites more for Clinton, young people for Obama, a little older Clinton, a little older Clinton, older Clinton. My favorite one though is education. No college, some college, college grads, post grads. Uh, and I like it because that Arkansas dot bumps out, right? Those are the friends of Clinton's, uh, you know, the postgraduate people in Arkansas. And I thought of this example really uh, as the point of visualization. It, you know, it, poses questions that you didn't know you had. Uh, it allows you to see structure and outliers and weirdness and think about things uh, that you didn't, you know, if I just gave this to you in tabular form, you can maybe figure it out, but not if you didn't know what you were looking for. And so I thought of this one as like visualization is some of the answer to our here is some data problem. The reason I think that's funny now uh, is, uh, you know, I think this, this one is fun and I still like, stick it in some of my conference talks just because I think it's, it's fun to show, especially when I can watch it. Uh, but like, I think it was cl a classic here is some data uh, in the sense that like, I don't think our readers actually actually figured that out. But the real thing that happened with uh, story and here's some data is that mobile solved this. Mobile killed the era of like making interfaces for people basically. Uh, and so right now, I think it's fun to think of like, you know, what are the problems that we have right now uh, and how will they have changed 15 years from now? And what are the ones that are gonna be solved just by accident, by, you know, by the accident here being like mobile is our platform in ways that it wasn't. Uh, so those are my ideas for today. And I think we have a couple of minutes for questions if you have them. Can you say a little bit about how the process from you thinking of how to analyze and show the data to where it actually shows up in the in the newspaper? Like, because I'm sure it's not just you, right? There's others in, involved. Yeah. So the question was about the process um, at a newspaper for thinking of ideas to to getting ending in the newspaper. Um, a lot of the work that I think an organization like the Times is most proud of is happening in small teams. You know, usually there's someone who's better at a variety of different skills. One about, you know, depending on the type of project, it's like either about reporting or analyzing or thinking about what it is you want to show. Usually there's someone who is a better uh, a developer, get better at front end development. Usually there's someone who's better at design. Um, and and those, those hats can vary. Um, and, you know, it scales uh, like a lot depending on the scope of the, on the scope of the project. Uh, and so, uh, you know, the, I think the answer really is like a mushy, it depends, right? Like for some, for some things, you know, you, you know, you have, you know, you know, an election's coming, like, months or years ahead. Um, there's some things that are daily breaking news that like you don't know you're going to make it yesterday and you're going to make it today. Um, and so how the variance of like the amount of reporting, the amount of sketching or like, you know, trying on different ideas and throwing ideas away um, and the, uh, you know, amount of like, you know, just we're working against a deadline, we have to publish something um, is going to just vary a ton depending on the type of project it is. Um, how did you assess the effectiveness of visualizations through the New York Times through reader feedback? Yeah, the effectiveness, uh, it changed in different eras. Um, you know, when I first started, uh, there was, uh, you know, there is sometimes buttons on it, uh, when you could, uh, you know, you know sent, write a letter um, and you could see sometimes like from, from those letters, um, what were effective. There was a, a, a social media era where you could tell if, you know, is something resonating just based on like, is this traveling further uh, than what it is? 
Um, and then, you know, there's also in Euro where it's like past both of those and you kind of can get a sense just from like traffic too, in some ways. I think that like traffic and effectiveness are probably, you know, reasonably correlated, consistent on some set of constraints, right? Like there are things, I, I think more things in life should have like diving difficulty attached to them. So like, you know, you get like five points for this jump and you get like zero points for like some map of pop culture, right? Like, um, you know, and so, uh, you know, conditional on that, uh, it, you know, it changed over time about like the way, the way people, you know, you could feel whether it's, it's traveling in the world or not. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Uh, fantastic talk as always. I'm curious about the, the abstraction piece. I really liked how you were saying, you know, dial down the abstraction. I'm curious if, um, you know, as there's been more of this style of communication, have people gotten more used to it and started to demand or expect more sophistication in the sort of visual storytelling, the data visualizations, et cetera? Or do you think that idea of dialing down the abstraction as much as possible sort of still holds? I do think the idea of dialing down still holds in, gen in, in general. Um, you know, I do think also at the same time, I would argue that there is some advance in sophistication. So, you know, in my, in my when I started at the Times, um, there is a, sort of a thought that like people can't understand scatter plots, which may or may not be true, but it really came out of like one very important editor there just being unable to understand scatter plots. Um, and uh, I think that era that is dead now uh, in the sense of like if uh, if you just put the right words on it to explain it, you can do anything you want, right? Uh, and there are times that you will fail in putting the right words on to, to explain it. And there are times that you will fail in choosing it as a form. And there are times that you will fail in like, uh, choose. but I think, I do think that some of the work that like, like an organization like the Times uh, is most, uh, most proud of really is still in some of that dialing down the abstraction. Like I think of an example, like, uh, there's like a, a pollution in India example that was very uh, was something that Times was very proud of, I think, in like 2021. Um, it's something that's still pushing on that, even though that all, you know, all the top people were thrown at that with all the most sophistication and a ton of resources. But it's real, still fundamentally about becoming more real. Uh, yeah, I guess I just wanted to follow up a little bit on that same question of effectiveness. Uh, you know, in our wonderful first talk, we learned a lot about how it's you know, it's really hard to sort of find a way to make the connection between what you're trying to display and your audience. Um, and you have produced so many of these for such a long period of time. Do you generally, like just as a very sort of practitioner kind of, kind of world that you live in, do you feel like you tend to hit the mark most of the time? Do you fall flat on your face at some points? Uh, you know, and what have you learned along the way? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I will, I will claim failure in a ton of my own work um, all the time, um, you know, and I think one thing that is interesting about effectiveness, um, I was struggling today because I can't see the screen, but uh, if you're familiar with some of the like election visualizations in the needle, right, like I, a, a lot of people, uh, Democrats in particular, uh, hate that, uh, hate that work. Um, I kind of think uh that they hate it for some good reasons, right? Uh, because it gave them an answer. You know, they hate it because it told them something they didn't already know. Uh, and that they, the same answer was present in a map of like pink Wisconsin at the time, uh, but they just didn't know how to read it. So I think there is some complicated questions about uh, what really, what truly effective means, uh, but I will not claim that like, uh, you know, I have never made work that I think of as like, truly perfect uh, in some way. And maybe as we learned this morning that that may be impossible anyway, because, you know, it's like truly perfect for who, um, you know, and like depending on your level of knowledge about something, your interest in you, well, um, something and viewing it at the same time. But, yeah. All right, our next speaker is our first online speaker. So it's Hadley Wickham. He's a chief scientist at our studio and an adjunct professor of statistics at the University of Auckland Stanford University and Rice University. So Halley is a developer of some of the most widely used tools for data analysis. This includes dplyr, ggplot, Luberdate, many, many more. So many, many of us, uh, especially the statisticians are, are much more productive and make much prettier graphs thanks to Hadley's tools. 
And um, the least we could do about this is, is, is give him the COPS President's Award, which is arguably the most prestigious prize we give out in statistics. So uh, he's gonna talk, I hear this is a new talk, so it's excited to hear it. It's ggplot2 past and present. All right, take it away, Hadley. Hey, so uh, thanks for having me. Um, I'm Hadley and I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, ggplot2 past and present and kind of to spoil the whole presentation, but the past of ggplot2 is basically me and the present is the, the much wider community. So what is ggplot2? I think there's two really important pieces to it. There's a, a theory and an implementation. And the theory comes from the grammar of graphics, uh, this fantastic book by Lee Wilkinson, who very sadly passed away late last year. And this is where the gg and ggplot comes from. It's the grammar of graphics. So we've got this fantastic theory. And the basic idea of this theory is that you can take any, pretty much any visualization, a very large set of visualizations, and break it down into these independent components. And that's really powerful because when you go to create your own new visualization, you can combine these components in, in creative new ways. So that's the theory, and then it's coupled with an implementation, an open source implementation uh, that's free for anyone to use. GGPod2 has really been successful beyond my wildest dreams. I remember when I was, I was working on it during my PhD, I thought how amazing it would be if you know maybe a thousand people used it. And I think it's now reasonable to say that uh, millions of people have used it. There's about 46,000 questions on Stack Overflow and two of them are popular enough. Uh, it's a really great sign, I think, when your, your software is sufficiently confusing that uh, people have asked the same question over a million times and gone to Stack Overflow for the answer. Uh, not particularly profound things, but how do you rotate the axis labels and how do you put two plots on the same page? And so that, that, that I think over the years, my criteria for success have kind of changed. I, I remember the first time I got a bug report about GDPR and that, you know, it came with a lot of mixed feelings. Obviously, it, you know, it sucks that my code was wrong and gave someone a wrong answer, but the fact that someone was A, using my tool and be cared enough to tell tell me about it was that was pretty cool and then i remember seeing my first published paper that used ggplot2 that that wasn't written by me and that that was really cool too. and then i think like this really peaked when there was a plot on the front page of the new york times not 100 percent created by ggplot2 but very much in, uh, very much involved in the process and i was like just blown away and and that was really where i think my my kind of positive stages of visualization popularity peaked. Uh, but the, the stages continue. So like the first time I saw ggplot2 used to commit academic fraud. Like it's now so famous that like fraudsters are using it. And then uh, most recently, we accidentally let one of the sub one of the ggplot2 domains lapse. And ggplot2 is sufficiently uh, hot enough uh, item that a porn site stole the domain name from us. So that is now my true true measure of the success of a visualization toolkit is if a porn site is trying to steal your domain names. A few milestones along the way. Uh, so ggplot2, as suggested by the name, was not the first thing before ggplot2. There was ggplot, which I worked on during my PhD. Uh, and you can see I, I dug out a, a plot that I presented back in 2006. If you're familiar with ggplot2, you can see the visuals have uh, remained pretty much the same. 2007 it was the first release of ggplot2, new release because it had a very different API. And I was really worried about breaking the hundreds or maybe tens of users of code by switching to this completely new system. Uh, 2014, we released uh, the 1.0 version of ggplot2, where I made uh, I'm pretty good at making very clear pronouncements about things that do not become true. Uh, so for the 1.0 announcement, I said to the community, like, that's it, ggplot2 is done. Uh, and then a year later, we announced a formal extension mechanism to ggplot2, which is, I think, a really important part of the story that once this extension mechanism was in place, people could start to extend ggplot2 in their own packages. 
Another really big milestone was in 2018, where we adopted kind of a formal governance model, which really reflected by that point, I was not the sole or even really the primary contributor to ggplots2. I was now just a member of a team. And that kind of culminated in 2020, uh, when Thomas Lynn Peterson took over the maintainership of the package. So as I said, ggplot2 is um, not just about me. Uh, a list of major contributors in roughly chronological order is Winston Chang, Lionel Henry, Thomas Lynn Peterson, Koshuke Takahashi, Klaus Wilker, Kara Wu, Hiroaki Yutani, and Jui Dunning. So these are the people whose names kind of appear in the ggplot2 R packages authors. They are the people who have the right to add code to ggplot2. But of course, there's hundreds and thousands of other people who have contributed on GitHub with the, the old ggplot2 mailing list, answered and asked and answered questions with Stack Overflow. And there's a very also a very vibrant community on Twitter as well. So much like uh, many of my talks these days, this one I decided to uh, cheat and use uh, Twitter to help me out because I really wanted this, the focus of this talk not to be on me, but to be on the broader ggplot2 community. So a few days ago, I tweeted out, uh, you know, what's your favorite ggplot2 extension? So if you're into ggplot2, I highly recommend like finding this tweet, going to that link. There's a, it's a really great kind of way of seeing what some of the most popular extensions are, as well as this really, really long list of really cool and very specialized ggplot2 extensions. And so I'm going to show you kind of a, a selection of some of these. Uh, some of them are the most popular. Some I think are really cool. Uh, just a mix to kind of give you a sense of uh, what's happening in the ggplot2 community today. So the first package uh, I want to talk about is Patchwork by uh, Thomas Lynn Peterson, who's also the now the maintainer of ggplot2. But he basically he became the, the maintainer really because uh, he was constantly nagging me to add new features and it was easier to just hire him first as an intern and then as a full-time employee at our studio to make them a reality. But the idea of the patchwork package is pretty simple and pretty cool. It's basically like a tiny little algebra for arranging ggplots on a page. So this is just a very simple snippet. So you can use the vertical bar to place plots horizontally and then uh, uh, the slash to place them vertically. And of course, there's a bunch more complicated features. You can add inset plots. You can arrange the plots on a page that pretty much any way you could imagine. Thomas is also the author of a bunch of other packages. GGiraffe, which is for plotting graphs or network data. GGAnimate for animations. Uh, and the GGForce, which contains a bunch of kind of random extensions. And then GGFX, which allows you to apply kind of pixel type shaders to your plot. Another really cool uh, package is GG Repel by Kamil Slavikovsky. Uh, the idea of GG Repel is, you know, a lot of the times you go to plot your data, you want to label the points, but when you label them, they're a overlapping mess and you can't really the labels. And so what GG Repel does is, as the name suggests, it repels those labels, uh, labels around so you can actually read them. Pretty, um, like such a simple idea, but it makes annotating your plots so much, much easier. And there's this wonderful little uh, diagram by uh, Alison Horst kind of illustrating the package. Next up, we've got ggText by Klaus Welker, who you might remember was one of the uh, authors of ggplot2. Uh, this basically allows you to format the text that appears in your plots in many different ways. So on this plot an example, and this plot in particular, we've styled the axis text, the color of the axis text to match the color of the bars. So this can be a really useful technique when you're trying to label stuff on your plot, um, just makes it easy to see the correspondence. This is a very simple example. ggText allows you in general to put arbitrary kind of markdown, simple HTML, in your text, and so you can do stuff, crazier stuff like this, like include label, like include images in your access labels. Klaus is also a fairly prolific author of ggplot2 extension packages. 
uh, also is written the cow plot package. I forget what the O stands for, but the C is for Klaus and the W is for Wilke. It's his collection of useful plotting utilities. And then uh, also the GG Ridges package, which produces those stacked uh, ridgeline plots, which you might have seen and seen before. Another really cool uh, package is uh, Plotly. Uh, Carlson Siebert worked on the R version. Plotly is a JavaScript visualization library, and uh, Carlson worked on the R side of it. One of the cool things about Plotly is you can give it a ggplot2 plot and then pretty easily turn that into an interactive uh, HTML and JavaScript graphic. So there's a few other tools like this in the ggplot2 universe uh, that allow you to take this formerly static plot and turn it into various types of interactive visualizations. But I think one of the, 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 the neatest things about this is that there's very little for you to do as the author of a ggplot2 visualization. You can start with your existing static visualization, a couple of extra lines of code, and you've got your first stab at an interactive visualization. GGDist uh, by Matt Kay is basically a grab bag of every possible way you can imagine of visualizing distributions. Uh, really heavily used. Uh, I think I think it's Matt's work in uh, Bayesian, you know, using a lot of Bayesian statistical methods where you've got these posterior distributions where you want to show. But generally, whenever you've got a distribution of data and you want to show that in some way, um, I think it allows you to do these kind of cool rain cloud plots that show both that abstract form of the density along with the individual data points. And then a bunch of other land stuff if we want to show uncertainty around lines and points and so forth. Moving on to sort of slightly more like specific, but I think equally cool packages, uh, GGB Swarm uh, by Eric Clark, Scott Cheryl Mix, and Charlotte Dawson implements this uh, B Swarm methodology, which I might be remembering incorrectly, but I think uh, was a Tuki idea. So this is uh, an idea like where you want to avoid overplotting. You don't want to put all the plots in the same place. One way to overcome that is just to randomly jitter them. Another way is to use a sort of quasi-random structure with some nice properties. And that's basically the idea of these B swarm plots that you kind of randomly move the plots around, but you use a random distribution where it's not too, it's not too likely that the points are going to overlap. Uh, GG Mosaic uh, by Haley Jepson, Heike Hoffman, and Di Cook implements a useful type of categorical visualization called a mosaic plot, uh, sometimes known as a Marimekko plot, but we've got two categorical variables on the X and Y axis. Uh, it's easy to see what's going on there. Uh, GG Bump by David Schoberg uh, implements these bump charts. Uh, often used for displaying rankings of things. This GM text path at first seems a little bit frivolous. Like the idea is it just allows you to uh, easily lay text out along any arbitrary curve, like the spiral here. Uh, you might wonder why does that really matter in a visualization? Uh, but it turns out to be really handy for direct labeling of lines. And here's a little example of that um, with density plots. So GMTX path uh, written by Alan Cameron and Tian van der Brand. Uh, a really specific package, which I think is really, really cool, is uh, GG Soccer by Ben Sylvani. It includes specifically tools for helping you visualize data about soccer. Uh, so it has this uh, annotate pitch, which like draws the, the pitch in the background where you've got data that has the positions of the individual players and allows you to easily kind of beam it in a bunch of different colors uh, and then describe the direction of play. I think this, I, I kind of really love these, um, these very, very specific examples just because it shows that, that you know, ggplot2 is kind of for everyone. And whatever sort of random or strange 
place where people are collecting data, there's probably someone using uh, ggplot2 to help understand it a little better. And then I just want to finish off with a couple of things that aren't directly related to ggplot2, but I think are just some really cool um, sort of movements, trends in the R community as a whole. Uh, and the first is this kind of explosion of packages that provide different color schemes. So I just picked this one here. I think this is particularly cool. This is by Sienna Bedford-Peterson. It's a, a palette uh, inspired by the women of the, of the inauguration. But you can find kind of color palettes inspired by like where's Anderson films. Uh, I think there's a package that's almost like entirely Bernie Sanders inspired palettes. Uh, palettes from famous artworks. Just, you know, I know, of course, some of these palettes are not going to be like the, the best in some kind of optimal choice for visualization, but they're just like so much fun. And I love that people are kind of learning and practicing how to develop our packages and distribute them to the world through these tools. You can kind of have an idea you know, whack up uh, our package on GitHub, a little website, share it on Twitter, you know, and hundreds of people are using it and they're all, like trying it out within a, in a couple of days. I just think that's a really, really amazing part of the R community. And then to finish off, uh, one of my favorite uh, recent hashtags is the artistry hashtag. So this is people uh, creating generative art with R. I mean, some people have are using ggplot2 for this, lots of people aren't. I just found uh, skimming through my feed three uh, artworks that I really liked, uh, one by Giamaka and Yene, another one by Jackie Tran, and the, the last one by Sharla Gelfand. And again, you know, I just love this, uh, that people just love the idea of basically people having fun with code and making beauty, you know, these are not visualizations, they're not trying to convey data in any way, they're just trying to create something that's attractive and appealing. And along the way, you're like practicing your, your programming skills. Like I think the idea that, you know, you can have fun with code, or you can, you can enjoy yourself have, writing R code is, is such a kind of a radical idea that it's not just, it's not just about this like serious research for your, your PhD. It's also about having fun and expressing yourself and uh, creating beauty in the world. And uh, on that note, I'd like to finish. Hi, Hadley, thanks, that was great. Oh. Oh, my. Um, so my question is, how much have you, can, can you describe how you use a data visualization research to design and make decisions for ggplot2? I mean, again, I'm not really doing much with uh, ggplot2 itself these days. Uh, back when I did, I, it's sort of interesting. Like I tried to, uh, I went to, to Viz a couple of years ago, which is one of the big computer science visualization research conferences. And it really felt to me like Viz was like sort of haute couture, like you've got these ateliers making incredibly like beautiful form-fitting gowns for like this one person. And I'm like a buyer for Target. Like if I can't roll it out to hundreds of thousands of people, it's uh, uh, not really applicable to me. So I, I, you know, I think there's a, you know, a lot of really fantastic visualization work going on out there where we you know, can, I you know, try to stay on top of it, try to take the ideas and incorporate them in ggplot2. One of the um, challenges with ggplot2 is now that it's become so popular, it's very difficult to change without breaking people's or changing existing people's plots. So, you know, now I think there's, there's a lot of research to indicate that the default color schemes in ggplot2 are suboptimal and we know better ways of doing them now but trying to charting a course where we can like incorporate the latest research somehow without changing you know, hundreds of thousands of existing plots is, is a challenge. I think we've, we've got some ideas that are in the, 
and the works kind of across the tidyverse and this idea of additions, I think is pretty powerful. But that, that's another challenge with, you know, creating work that's used by a lot of people is that it, it does get difficult to change it. We do have one question online. Uh, please share with us the best way, especially for beginners, to practice ggplot2. So if you want to uh, practice ggplot2, I think the number one best way is to just use it on different data sets. And the best way I think to do that right now is uh, Tidy Tuesday. So Tidy Tuesday is a hashtag and it's a project that basically every Tuesday uh, releases a fun little data set and kind of challenges you in a pretty open-ended way generally to visualize it. And so this gives you like a constant stream of new data of slightly different types to practice your other data manipulation skills on to create a visualization. And then because there's like this active community on Twitter, like you can share what you've done with other people. They're excited about it. You can learn from them. They learn from you. I think that's just a you know a great fun way to get get better. And I think our last question: Are there any plans to increase the accessibility for ggplot for blind and low vision people? Yeah, I think uh, visualization of. Um, the sort of accessibility for ggplot2 is a, is a tough question because you know ggplot2 is fundamentally designed for visualization so it's it's never going to be like the best solution for people who, who don't see well uh, what we have been working on have made a few small steps towards is uh, making it easier to add alt text so if you have created a visualization uh, and you add a text caption to it, we've kind of started the work. So you can add that to ggplot2 and hopefully and eventually kind of have that follow through the whole pipeline into your final published output. Uh, the R Markdown team have done some stuff recently too to make it easier to add alt text to our Markdown documents. And then we now have a little, tiny little bit of integration with the, the Braille R uh, package as, as requested by the author. But yeah, it's a hard problem and we haven't made uh, much progress. Thank you very much. Uh, we are at three o'clock right now, so we are running a bit behind. Let's give a round of applause for Hadley. Hopefully he can hear us. Again, okay. thank you. In visual, visual journalism at the School of Communication at the University of Miami. He's worked in newspapers as one of the first to put data plots in newspapers. And now he teaches journalism, as I mentioned. He has written various data visualization textbooks and he consults with several companies. And today he will be talking, oh, he's also the co-organizer co of this, of this uh, symposium. So thank you for that, Arvot. So today he's gonna talk about what you design is not what people see. Take it away. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. First of all, let's confirm that everybody is listening to me because apparently some people in the online audience was not hearing correctly. Can anybody confirm uh, in the chat window? Perfect. All right. Great. There may be some background noise, by the way, because I'm, I'm sitting outdoors. It's lovely down here in Florida. And I was born in northwestern Spain, where it's rainy and cold and windy and and dark usually, and whenever there is sun outside, I'd like to see it outside, it's very pleasant. And it makes my mood much better, which I, th I think that is great for a talk like this today. Anyway, so nice talking to you all uh, today. Sorry about that, yeah, somebody said in the chat window, it's not making us jealous. Yeah, anyway, sorry about that. Uh, so let's go, to the, uh, let's go to the presentation itself. So yeah, I would like, the title of the presentation is, <clears throat> what you design is, parenthesis, not what people see, and other myths related to how we talk and how we envision visualization to communicate with the general public, which is essentially what I, what I specialize on, what I have devoted my entire, my entire career my entire career too. So I would like to talk a little about, about these myths because I think that it is very, very important that we get data visualization right. And when I say we, I refer to anybody who uses visualization to communicate ideas. And that may be journalists such as Amanda, uh, who is amazing, you have just seen that, or, a, 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 or Jessica Holman, who you're going to meet, 
very, very soon, or Liz Padilla, or Alvita, who presented before, or Hadley, and all of you, that we get data visualization right, mainly because data visualization is quickly, quickly becoming a universal language. It's widespread, and this is not news for most of you, for communication. And the, new, the good news is that people love data visualization. And when I say people, I refer to the general public. We have plenty of evidence to show this. Many of the most popular stories ever published by American newspapers and non-American newspapers are actually data visualizations. For many years, this graphic that you have here on the screen, commonly called the dialect map, uh, published by the New York Times years ago. The actual title is How You'll Use and Good You Guys Talk. For many years, this was the most popular piece ever published by the New York Times. That might be true still today. I don't know, but that was the case when it was published almost a, almost a decade ago. Uh, the mo uh, it was so popular, by the way, that it even became a book at some point, right? Speaking American, which is a lot of fun. If you enjoy data visualization and you like art books and coffee table books, I strongly recommend this book because it's, it's amazing. It's a lot of fun. And also that you visit the original piece. Something that I forgot to mention, by the way, before I proceed is that once I finish talking today, I will make a, I will find a way to share my slides with you. So you, if you cannot write down any of these references, don't worry. The, the, the slides will be publicly available in one way or another. Um, El País, the most you know, the most important, the most widely read newspaper in the country where I'm from, I'm originally from Spain, as I mentioned before, the most popular story they ever published is not a data visualization, but it's still a visualization, an information graphic or explanation graphic that they published at the beginning of the pandemic, trying to show how a virus spreads in, in, in enclosed, in enclosed uh, spaces. The most popular story ever published by the Washington Post is also a data, is also a data visualization. It was also published at the beginning of the pandemic, it visualizes how a virus spreads in a population, depending on where on whether a country takes measures or doesn't take measures against this part of the pandemic. Now, you may be thinking, well, but these are, you know, pandemic related graphics, obviously they are popular, right? So these are sort of like anecdata, no? but we have more evidence than that. A, a, few, a few months after this particular piece was published, the Washington Post is closed, that's a car passing by. Uh, the, the Washington Post disclosed in a job posting that they published that out of the seven most popular stories that the Washington Post has ever published, out of those seven, six of them were graphics. This was in the job description. Uh, that, that was published a few years, a, a few months later, because they were hiring new visual journalists and graphics journalists. And so six out of the seven most visited stories in the history of the Washington Post have been graphics. That's amazing. That's great news. As I usually joke to my students, this is fantastic news because it means that I will have a job until that I retire, which hopefully will happen very, very soon. I'm working on that. However, however, and this is the, this is the important part. I think that we also are still dealing with several myths that I believe are damaging to getting a good understanding of what data visualization is truly about when we use it to communicate with others. As you know, data visualization can be used also for exploration. It can be used for with artistic purposes in some cases, as Hadley mentioned before. There is a type of visualization that I like to call affective data visualization, which is more oriented to creating emotions on the part of the reader. But that is not the, the type of visualization that I'm referring to. I'm talking about visualizations that are designed to communicate, communicate ideas. So what are these myths? Well, these myths are actually widespread and I still encounter them wherever I go, uh, among journalists, among designers, among scientists, among statisticians, among the different types of people I usually work with, which is very varied. A picture is worth a thousand words. Well, this is widespread and it's also not true. Uh, the data should speak for itself. This is particularly common in the world of business analytics. I hear all the time when I work for companies like, just show me the data, the data should speak for itself. This is extremely dangerous, particularly if you, are, if you don't have a very good grasp of what the data is about, right? Or if the statistics are boring, then you've got the wrong numbers. This is a, favor, uh, a famous quote from uh, by Professor Edward Tafti, who's also the author of some of <clears throat> foundational books in the world of data visualization. I also think that it's wrong. Uh, to design visualizations, you should learn and follow certain rules, right? This is also quite widespread. It's sort of like an intrinsic idea that recently I'm, I'm trying to fight to fight against. This particular idea of rules, by the way, I think that it is implicit in many of the in many of the books that have been published 
in the past decade or decade and a half, among them my own books, right? That there is sort of to a certain extent, and to, uh, uh, to different degrees, they sort of like implicitly convey the idea that if you read this book, if you apply these principles to the world, then your data will speak for itself or your graphic will be readily understandable. You will be doing a good, a good job. Don't get me wrong, by the way, all these books are great. I, mean, I will recommend any of these from Call News Bummer's uh, Storytelling with Data down to other topics, the visual display of quantitative information. But what I usually try to, sp is, is to talk to people about is that we need to take all this advice with a grain of salt. Right, and we need to read these books as, as as if we were reading books about how to write better. And I will get back to that analogy a little bit later during the presentation today, because the story is a little bit more complicated than that. So let's talk about the myths one by one. Let me begin by showing you uh, something that will refute the first myth. It's not a data visualization, but it's still a nice story that I have been I've been I've been telling for quite a long time because it's a lot of fun, but it's it's, it's very funny also, but also a quite a quite explanatory. What I mean. Probably you are all familiar with these, right? The Dunkin', the Dunkin' Donuts logo, right? That they print in all their products. And you all know how to read it, right? America runs on Dunkin'. We all know how to read this picture. So therefore the picture is worth a thousand words. We don't need to have the thousand words. We just need the picture. But that is because we have a mental model of how to read this picture. I will get to mental models a little bit later, right? We all know how to read it because someone has explained to us how to read it. This is also quite going to be quite important later on. If you don't have that mental model, if nobody has told you how to read this picture, you will probably read this picture as, okay, so uh, why is this person running away? from the United States, right? That, that's another possible interpretation of this picture. It's per per perfectly legitimate. When I moved to the United States 10 years ago, for the second time, by the way, I moved to the US twice, um, my little kid was uh, six months old. And then a few years later, when he was like four or something like that, uh, he saw this picture. He was some, drinking a, a cup of coffee from Dunkin' Donuts. He stared at the picture and he asked, Dad, why is that man waving from inside a toilet. I said, what, what, what do you mean waving from inside a toilet? And then I realized that he was seeing a tilted toilet and then a person coming out of the toilet and waving the hand, waving his or her hand in this, in this particular case. So pictures can be greatly ambiguous and they can also be misunderstood if someone doesn't explain it to us. Now, try to let's translate these into the world of data visualization. A couple of the speakers that you're going to hear about later, both Jessica and, and Lace Padilla, have done incredible work related to how people interpret and misinterpret interpret displays of uncertainty. Among them, you know, the National Hurricane Center's a, a, a hurricane map, common hurricane map, which is a type of map that I get to see uh, in, in living in Miami, right? In Miami, the weather is not as lovely always as it is today. Sometimes we get hurricanes and tropical storms and we need to deal with this map. And this map is usually used to inform the public about where a hurricane may go in the following five days. It gets picked up by TV stations, it gets repurposed by journalists, and a lot of people still get it wrong. Among them, many journalists. I've heard many journalists on TV explaining how to read this graphic wrong. So how do people interpret this graphic wrong? Well, all of you probably know that this is a display of uncertainty, but the way that many people read it is, is a display of, of sort of like an area under threat. Meaning that, for example, in a map like this corresponding to Hurricane Dorian, some people see this map and they tend to believe that, for example, in the, if they live in, uh, on Key West, which is in the Keys, the little island, islands on the bottom left of Florida, right? If I live in Key West, which is the last island over there, I may not be at risk because the cone is very far from me. Therefore, I am far from the area under threat, right? They see this display as an either or inside or outside, when in reality, the display is much more complex than that. Some people even see this, by the way, and we have some evidence showing this, that um, a, they see the map and they envision uh, 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 the size of the hurricane, like the hurricane growing in size, right? It's very little at the very beginning and then increases increases in size. Some people even see the dotted area on the, on, on the top of the hurricane, as you can see, and they interpret that as rain for some reason. It's not really rain, but it does look like rain. 
And that's critical. That's very important. I don't think that people are stupid. What they are actually applying is a wrong mental model to interpreting this type of graphic. They use a mental metaphor that is usually used to represent other types of data, such as enclosed areas or areas that are different than other areas, right? And they apply that mental model to reading a graphic that is actually not talking about areas. It's talking about a, a set of possible positions of the center of the storm in the following five days. Now, I'm not going to bore you with how to read the, uh, the actual way to read this graphic. It's something that I have done in, in a book already, in my previous book, and you can read online. You can even go to the National Hurricane Center. They have a good explanation of how to read this hurricane map. But I do believe that it needs to be explained. And this connects to something, as you may notice this talk, even if the speakers this afternoon, we didn't coordinate at all in the content of our talks. What I'm saying actually connects with uh, what, what all the speakers are, are, are saying. Jessica will probably talk about this. Alvita mentioned it at the very beginning. Uh, Amanda talked about this, the importance of words, of explaining things to people, right? Now, fortunately, there are more people doing this because we need to fight against what I like to call the naive conception of visual communication or how visual communication works. Implicitly, many people tend to believe that all that matters when we design a visualization is to get the data depicted accurately and correctly. And I think that derives, this derives from Edward Taft is what Taft used to call graphical integrity, right? If you represent your data very accurately, very precisely, then you're doing it right. And he even came up with a list of a, sort of like a checklist of things to make your graphic uh, correctly correctly done, which I think is great, don't get me wrong. But we, we cannot forget that what matters is not only what we design, what really matters is what people perceive because we're trying to communicate something to, to someone. It is not enough to apply rules, principles, best practices to design, and then expect that people magically will interpret these, will interpret this graphic, this graphic correctly. The picture is much more complicated than that. Because again, the challenge is that, and the, and actual, the actual way to explain how people interpret or misinterpret graphics is that on one side, you have the designer, on the other side, you have the reader. On the one side, you have the designer who has a meaning in mind that we want to communicate, right? In, in the language of hermeneutics, we will call this the meaning. We have the meaning and we translate that meaning. We encode that meaning in the language of visualization. We get our information, we depict it through symbols. We use encoding some channels to represent the data. This is all related, by the way, to Hadley's talk because he mentioned the grammar of graphics by a Lila Wilkinson, which is a wonderful book. And then the result is a visualization. These are the components of the visualization. That's the side of the designer. But on the other side of the designer, you have the, the reader, right? And the reader may come to your graphic with a completely different mental model in mind, right? In the language of, in the language of linguistics and linguistic analysis, we will call this the significance. Significance in this context is not a statistical significance. Significance simply means the interpretation that the, that the reader has of the graphic that we are presenting. So when there is a match between the model that you have in mind when you're sending your graphic to convey the meaning and the mental models that the reader brings to the interpretation of the graphic, when there is a match, then yeah, there is understanding. But when there is a mismatch, there will be misunderstanding and we need to care about that. That's why testing graphics is so important. It is amazing to me, and. I am, I am not blameless, right? That graphics, particularly news media, are not tested formally more and more often. And again, this is something that I have, I, I'm to blame myself, not to, not to do that more often. But it sh they should be, they should be tested, tested more often. But not only that, they should be explained because we have some evidence of this, that when you explain how to read this graphic to people, the next time they see this graphic, they will tend to read it better. And I, that's why I believe that it is so wonderful that in the past few years, there have been some initiatives to try to increase graphical literacy among the general public, what, what is usually called graphicacy, graphical literacy, right? There is a column right now, a newsletter in the Washington Post titled How to Read This Chart by Philip Bump. There's a section in the New York Times calling, called What's Going On With This Graphic. There's a section in The Economist called Off the Charts. All these newsletters, I think, are great. And probably there are many other, many other initiatives 
initiatives to increase graphical literacy among the general public. And also as a result of that, also statistical literacy in some sense. I even wrote a column myself years ago about for the New York Times in particular, explaining how to read the Code of Uncertainty just because I got that map wrong the first time that I saw it. I didn't know what I was looking at until someone explained it to me, in this case, the National Hurricane Center, because I read the documentation of that particular graphic. Now, what about the second half of, of these myths down here, right? The statistic is boring, then you got the wrong numbers. To design visualization, you should learn and follow some rules. I already discussed it a little bit, but let's focus a little bit more on the, if the, if the statistics are boring, you've got the wrong numbers. I think that this is also only true if you're speaking to people who are like you, meaning you are a biostatistician or you are a do medical doctor talking to another medical doctor showing statistics about your particular field, obviously the statistics will be interesting per se on their own, right? Be just because you have an audience who is predisposed to be interested in that particular in that particular data set. But if you want to communicate that to the general public, you better be ready to pay attention to things such as visual design, to dress up your graphics a little bit, to pay attention to style, to make your graphics in some cases fun, right? There's nothing wrong with making graphics fun, right? As long as you respond, depending on the context and dependence of, depending on the topic, obviously, but trying to present your graphics in a way that is friendly and, and joyful and attractive, that is not, charging, which is a term that I despise deeply, right? That is that is something that really may enhance understanding in the first place because it can help bring people into the data. So they will look at your data in the first in the first place. So let me just finish here by talking about what I what I like to consider one of the main rule breakers in the past in the past few years. Probably many of you are familiar with this one. This is Ed Hawkins's warming stripes graphic. This is a visual representation of the variation of the average global temperature all over the world in the past 200 years, if I'm not if I'm not wrong. You have never heard of this graphic, just be aware that it's probably one of the most popular visualizations ever created, right? It has appeared, it, it was picked up by The Economist magazine uh, and it appeared on the cover of The Economist magazine. People have brought it to protests against climate change. There, is, there are even reports of people printing out in their clothing. Uh, there was also one guy who printed it out and put it on his Tesla, right? And apparently he runs around with that Tesla around town. So it's super, super popular, incredibly popular, even if it breaks a lot of rules in terms of rules, quotation marking there, of visualization, of visualization and sign. So let me talk a little bit about it, just because I, I interviewed Hawkins for the book that I'm currently writing, or I'm supposed to be currently writing, although it's much more fun to talk to you today rather than spending the afternoon writing a book. So I think that it's important to understand what Ed Hawkins did in this particular case. He wanted to create a graphic, according to what he says about this graphic, a graphic that it was not intended to be analytical, right? To represent the data in a very accurate, in a very accurate manner. He didn't want that. There are many other graphics that are better for that, right? We could display the data in a different way to make the data, so the interpretation of the data a little bit more accurate. He didn't also want to design a graphic to communicate something particularly complicated. He just wanted a striking image, something that used the data, represented the data, but looked striking enough to bring people in and then have a conversation about that particular that particular data set. That's why the graphic is colorful and fun and has that particular shape that it has. Honestly, what is it that you are more likely to look at at a quick glance, the graphic on the left or the graphic on the right? Both of them are wonderful, don't get me wrong. I love the graphic on the left. The graphic on the left, in my opinion, is, a, is also a very important graphic designed in the 20th century. That's the, it's commonly called the hockey, the hockey stick chart designed by climate scientists such as Michael Mann back in the, back in the 90s and published by the IPCC. Wonderful graphic that has been replicated several times, but it is not very attractive, right? It's sort of like this traditional Excel looking graph like any other of the tens of thousands graphics that we have seen everywhere. What is it more likely to initiate a conversation? Probably the second one, right? We see the second one and say, oh, what's going on? This is, this is so interesting, show me more. And that gives an opportunity to show the second to the first graphic that we have over here to start getting a conversation that we that will get at the nitty gritty of the story that we are trying to have a discussion about which in this case is probably climate change 
he broke the rules. Actually, I remember myself looking at this graphic for the first time and asking, oh, what WTF? What is this going? What is this graphic? What is this crap? It doesn't have a scales. Oh, it doesn't have a legend. I remember my reaction to, to this graphic for the first time until I realized again that his goal was not to create an accurate, super precise, super detailed analytical representation of the data. He wanted to create a more effective visualization, something that will essentially punch people in the face or bring them into the information that he was trying to represent. And the graphic is successful, was extremely successful at that, right? He brought it, apparently he designed this graphic for a conference and it obviously was a sensation. And again, it's all over the world. So that's a popular test in my book, right? The response to the graphic has been massive, have been completely massive. And for me, that's a test for success. Now, everything that I'm saying right now here, let me circle back to what I said at the very beginning. It doesn't mean that learning about principles of visualization is not important. It is, right? There are certain things that we need to learn about how our visual system processes information, about the limitations of what our, 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 our for example, our short-term memory can do, a term that you have already heard from in previous talks. It's important to learn all about that. But all these principles of visualization or these quotation mark rules of visualization are not a straight jackets. They are just the basics, the foundations for a conversation, right? The good designs, like the ones that you have seen so far, particularly by, by Amanda and, and people from the New York Times in particular, the, the ones that you have seen, uh, before, they are not the product of sort of like a person sitting in front of a computer designing something and that's it. No, there's a lot of conversation, a lot of feedback. Is this going to work? Is this not going to work? Let's try this. Let's try that. Trial and error. That's the conversation that I'm talking about. The best, best visualizations are usually the product of that conversation that we have with others or that we have with ourselves for communication. Remember always that I'm talking about visualization for communication applying these principles as a starting point for this conversation are also considering other possible constraints, such as the nature of the data that we're representing, such as the public or the audience that we're talking to. All those are constraints that should guide our decisions. And this is the reason why I said at the very beginning, I made this very short sort of like analogy between visualization and writing. More and more in my own teaching, I find myself teaching my students how to visualize better in the same way that I will teach them how to write better. So writing, very, very much like writing, as I mentioned this in this slide, visualization is not based on a set of rules. It does have a grammar, the grammar of graphics, right? It has a set of symbols, right? And there are certain constraints and limitations of what we can do. But then once we consider those, there's a lot of freedom. There's a lot of leeway what to do with any of that. There's a lot of expressive possibilities, for example. And usually when we want to represent data, there is not a single way that is completely correct to represent data. There may be more than one option. So there is a lot, lots of subjectivity in the way that we represent information to people and conversations are essentially in that process. And that doesn't mean obviously that we cannot use empirical evidence to guide our decisions. We can, right? And you're going to hear more about these from the researchers who are going to talk after, after me. Anyway, that's all that I, I, I wanted to share with you today. These are just some, some quick thoughts um, that I thought may be, may be useful. I'm going to try to share my slides during the Q&A through the chat window in the, uh, on Zoom. But then for, for all of you who are in the audience physically, and you cannot access the chat window, obviously, on Zoom. Uh, if you want to get the slides, you can email me, and I will send you a link to the slides so you can download them. My email is very easy to remember, alberto.cairo at gmail.com. Thank you so much. Hi. Uh, I know you can't see me, Alvita. Uh, really great talk, as usual. I have a question, though. I feel like I've been also thinking about this for a while and uh, looking at thinking about how we can treat visualization the way we think about communication with text. And with text, we have different types of communication. You have like persuasive, descriptive, and so forth. And I'm curious about, do you think we should be thinking about visualization more like that? And what does it mean to, dis to, to, to create a descriptive versus a persuasive visualization? Yeah. I mean, I... I probably as you know, I, I tend to agree with that. I think that eventually we will come up with ways of talking about visualization for communication in a similar way that we talk about writing in general. In, in, in the sense that we will start applying more and more uh, the uh, tools coming from, from, from text analysis, from linguistic analysis, analysis, from hermeneutics, from rhetoric, 
right? Visual rhetoric. How do we apply tools to analyze visualization? So absolutely. I mean, I cannot give you a specific answer of how I will do that myself, but more and more, I have the intuition that that is going to happen more, and particularly when uh, people in the humanities are, are are getting interested in this in this field and applying the, the the tools and the techniques used in the humanities to analyze text, to analyze other types of images, also to analyze data visualization. I'm very excited for uh, about the prospect uh, of that type of uh, that type of more humanistically oriented research. It's not something that I will do myself. I, I will be just happy to read what other uh, great people will have to will have to say about that. Okay, our next speaker is Jessica Holman. She's currently the Ginny Ramadi Associate Professor of Computer Science at Northwestern University, where she co-directs the MU Collective, a lab devoted to improving visualization and data interfaces by leveraging theory and empirical findings on judgment under certainty. She's worked, um, Jessica's work has received Best Paper and Honorable Mention Awards at Top Visualization and Human Computer Interaction Venues. She has been invited to speak at the US Federal Reserve Board, Swiss National Bank, the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, and the Centers and the CDCs, among others. And today she's going to speak about visualization as model checks. Sounds like what I do almost day. Thank you. OK, great. Thank you. Um, so yeah, thanks for inviting me today. It's an honor. Uh, also fun for me to speak alongside so many friends. Um, I want to talk about visualizations as model checks. I'll explain what, what that means as I go. Um, and this talk is kind of similar to how others have spoken about sort of what I've learned over time, uh, doing research on visualization specifically for uh, reasoning under uncertainty. There we go. So visualization interfaces obviously influence how we think about and make decisions from data, from predictive models in a variety of settings, from daily life to you know business intelligence, gover government policy making, science. <laughs> And today I want to consider what our goals are when we use visualizations to learn from data across these various settings. So one way to think about what we or what we want to learn from data when we visualize it gets at where our visualization falls in a larger data analysis process, which statisticians like Tukey pictured here, Chatfield, and many others have described. So after a stage of what we might call data diagnostics, where we take in our data, we initially look at it, maybe try to find errors, begin to look at what kind of variables we have, maybe we think about how we might map them to visualizations. We then go on to what Tukey famously called exploratory data analysis, where we go through this process of trying to understand what our data tell us. Initially, we're sort of in this open-minded discovery type phase. We're not really thinking probabilistically. We want to see what stands out in terms of patterns and what we can rule out completely because it wouldn't be a consistent explanation. But according to Tukey, this is followed by this intermediate phase where we begin to weigh how much evidence we have in favor of certain interpretations. Maybe we think we see some structure in our data, we see a certain relationship that looks maybe linear, we see some bimodal distribution, and we try to ascertain how real that pattern or structure is relative to noise. Perhaps we even do some exploratory model building where we fit some statistical models and compare the predictions to our data. And then finally, in this canonical analysis workflow, we often assume there's some confirmatory analysis that will be done ideally on new data to really make sure that what we thought we learned, we actually did learn. And there's a lot of subtlety in the workflow implied here. So for instance, we can talk about how this isn't really a straightforward linear process. It's actually often iterative. Um, but today I wanna talk about nuance that I think often gets overlooked by visualization researchers and those using um, and creating visualizations, which concerns the difference between these middle two phases. So we have this exploratory phase where we're really concerned about finding signal, what might be signal. And then we have this sort of intermediate phase where we're really concerned about weighing signal against noise um, or imprecision or uncertainty. And one reason this distinction matters is because if we're gonna be looking for patterns to generate hypotheses or questions in the first place, we might make choices in visualizing our data that make it easier to see trends and worry less about the potential noise or variance on, or uncertainty that might affect those patterns. And some popular visual analysis tools do seem to prioritize finding patterns over judging how reliable they are. Tableau software, for instance, which came out of visualization research will default to some aggregation, which makes it easy to find patterns and see signal in big data. 
So on the right here, we see data that's aggregated by default, in this case, by mean rather than sum. And on the left, we see disaggregated data. And you can see there's a big difference in terms of how easy it is to pick out the signal. You would hope that anyone using a tool like Tableau to analyze data would know that it's hard to draw conclusions about how reliable a trend is without disaggregating the data. But this may not be the case. As an example, a few years ago, we asked novices, so people not trained in analysis, to generate observations about a population as they assess statistical graphics of data sets of various sizes, and we recorded their confidence. And we showed them either aggregated data on the right here or disaggregated data. And we found that the aggregated data led people to reason more dichotomously about any differences they saw. So they'd say, there's a difference here, there's a trend here, but they wouldn't talk about how big it was. And their confidence in their generalizations about this population um, as they moved from a larger data set to a smaller data set was not really uh, updated. So they, they felt about the same confidence level. So it may not always be clear to users of visualizations the implications of, of the design choices that are made for, for viewing signal against noise. So let's consider now what we do know about how to help people reason under uncertainty from visualized data. In other words, uncertainty visualization by which we usually mean uh, visualizing some quantified um, distribution or quantified uncertainty in an estimate like the sampling distribution of a statistic. Whoops. There's a number of canonical statistical graphics from the use of summary marks to show constructs like error bars, um, or sorry, uh, confidence intervals or uh, properties of a distribution like box plots um, to approaches that map probability instead to what we would call a visual variable like area or width in a violin plot or height in a density plot or area um, or even uh, opacity um, or blur in a gradient plot. In general, the more expressive the visualization is of the underlying distribution, the better. However, we've found that we can do even better than some of these continuous uh, uh, depictions of probability by mapping probability um, using a frequency framing. Um, and I think this makes the, the meaning of the distribution more concrete. So motivated in part by this robust finding from cognitive psychology that in some cases re-expressing a probability as a frequency can help people uh, use it in classic Bayesian and reasoning tests, the kind that Albita spoke about. Um, the, the idea is just that rather than saying 30%, you would say something like three out of 10 times or you'd show people an icon array, again, similar to what Albita showed us. So in collaboration with Matt Kay, I took this intuition and applied it to create a quantile dot plot, basically a discretized version of a density plot. And here on the left, we see a diagram of how one can quickly estimate probabilities potentially of one-sided intervals with this kind of frequency-based uncertainty representation. And we, when we created these, we wanted to help people make quick decisions in settings like trying to decide when to leave for the bus um, to make sure that you catch it. And so in several studies, we found that this technique performed well relative to more standard continuous dis, uh, depictions of distributions, including um, leading to more utility optimal decisions um, and better recall as well of a distribution. Another frequency framing I've worked on, I call hypothetical outcome plots, where we're taking random draws from a target distribution, which might be a joint distribution um, in a multivariate case. And we're presenting each draw, um, multivariate draw potentially, as a frame in an animation. And we do this without changing the underlying visual encodings in the plot, which lets us express uncertainty in a visualization that's already complex without having to you know, add another color encoding or add you know, an error bar to something like a network. And despite how jarring these might look relative to static visualizations, we found in a few studies that hypothetical outcome plots can improve probability judgments, again, Bayesian reasoning, and assessments of which of multiple possible uh, models is more likely to be compatible with an observed data set. And since their inception, these techniques have gotten some recognition as well among the broader data science uh, community. But you know, I have to be honest, a few years ago, I did stop believing that better uncertainty visualization techniques were really enough um, alone to lead to good inference from visualizations. And one reason is simply that the vast majority of estimates that are routinely presented in the media and government um, and even in business are not accompanied by explicit representation of uncertainty in the form of you know, distribution or uncertainty intervals, even though a lot of these visualizations are intended for inference, for, for extrapolation to a population. So for example, a couple of years ago, I looked at about 450 charts from government statistical reports, the media, all of these presented estimates intended for inference, only 3% explicitly conveyed any kind of distributional information. And that includes, you know, just plotting the data, the, the actual observations. 
So economist Chuck Mansky calls this incredible certitude. And there's various rationales that authors may have for not communicating uncertainty, like not wanting to confuse readers. So a few years I became interested in exactly, you know, why don't we see more uncertainty? So I interviewed um, uh, and surveyed a number of professional data journalists, um, visualization designers, data scientists about their beliefs about uncertainty and how they do it, how they, how they visualize it. And despite many of them saying that they really thought this was, you know, an important part of visualization, we need to make uncertainty explicit. You know, I heard a lot of reasons for not doing it um, based on, you know, not thinking it had a critical role to play. So a common system of beliefs appears to be that, you know, visualizations are really designed to convey signal and the analysis process that the author might go through in order to figure out what to visualize for others um, is thought to sort of validate this signal. And, you know, a lot of the authors I talked to thought, well, you know, the audience doesn't really need me to explain the uncertainty and get into the nuance. They just trust me a priori. And so in this view, uncertainty is not necessarily something we want to show people. It obfuscates signal. Whoops, my slides are jumping. So maybe it's not that easy to just tell people to visualize uncertainty all the time, I started to think. Um, so I want to talk now about what can go wrong when we visualize it, which helped me realize um, why we have to be careful and why we need to go further. So one generic yet important type of uncertainty judgment that comes in whenever we are using a visualization to judge sort of the reliability of some pattern we see is, is how people perceive effect size. So given two distributions, a common measure of effect size is called the probability of superiority um, or common language effect size. This is the proportion of time or probability that a random draw from one distribution will be higher than a random draw from another. Effect size is the kind of judgment we sort of implicitly should be doing all the time when we look at data and we're trying to judge whether we see something that's really interesting or, or important. Um, and in my initial research on hops, I looked at how different uncertainty visualizations impact people's effect size judgments. And there I observed that in particular that users of error bars and violin plots seem to map the difference in means that they saw in a visualization um, to this effect size scale. So if there was a big difference in means, they'd say this is a big effect, or there's a high probability of superiority. If it was a small difference, they'd say it was a small effect. So this you know, begs the question, what defines a big or a small difference? And there's sort of this heuristic that implies that maybe there's some visual aspect of the chart that defines this. So one possibility is that big and small are judged relative to the total vertical space in a chart like this, which will depend then on the axis scaling. This is consistent with another experiment where we ask people to judge effect size and state willingness to pay for a treatment viewing either 95% confidence intervals or prediction intervals. Um, they got uh, the corresponding information from either of these visualizations in text. So a rational agent would, would not um, have different beliefs about effect size based on whether they saw one of these charts or the others. They had all the information, um, but people did um, you know, tend to overestimate effect size and overpay for the treatment much more with the confidence intervals. And we also played with axis scaling oops, um, and tried to look at, well, if we rescale the axes on a CI chart to match the predictive distribution um, stats, you know, does that help? And it did in fact help a bit, um, not completely. So people are using some sort of distance-based heuristic to, do, to judge things like effect size. The most focused study we've done on the topic led by my student Alex Kale set out to directly test whether users are relying on a distance between distributions as a proxy for effect size. This was uh, an experiment where we showed people distributions with multiple levels of variance on a common axis scale such that at lower variance on the top here, distance is a better cue for effect size at higher variance, it's a, um, or sorry, at lower variance, it's a worse cue, at higher variance, it's a better cue for effect size. Um, and the task was modeled after a fantasy sports game where they're told they can, they can choose to buy a new player, this red distribution, and they wanna um, try to win an award shown here um, with this line. Um, so they're really trying to decide, is it worth it to invest in the new player? On each trial, we asked them probability superiority or effect size, and also whether they would decide to buy the new player given a payoff function. And if we think about how a visual distance heuristic might play out in terms of probability of superiority on the y-axis here, um, relative to the true effect size, at high variance where uh, effect size is a better cue, we might see something closer to what we should see, this straight line. Um, we see a little bit 
of underestimation. Um, but at low variance where distance, visual distance is a worse cue, we should see something much closer to people just being biased to always sort of being uncertain and always saying 50%. So we wanted to compare what we found in the experiment from participants data um, curves like this to this normative um, response and to the predictions of this, this idea that they either use the, the visual uh, distance heuristic or not. We showed them different uncertainty visualizations. We annotated means in some, thinking that when you annotate the mean on a chart like a hypothetical outcome plot, you know, people really should um, change how they make their decisions, we, we might see them start to use the means and use a mean distance heuristic in this case. Um, so that was sort of our expectation. And we had them do lots of trials with and without the means. What we found when we analyzed the data, however, was a little surprising. So I don't have time to walk through the full results, so you can take my word for it because, you know, that's what audiences do. I don't have to show you the uncertainty. But in terms of high level findings, we found that adding means had a very small effect on the probability estimates. So it was consistent with a mean distance heuristic, but it was much smaller than we thought. So adding means didn't really change how people uh, made these decisions. And when we looked deeper into the data, it appeared that actually everyone was using these kind of, not everyone, but vast majority of people were using these distance heuristics. Um, even when you know, uh, they were given uh, visualizations that did not make the mean salient at all, including the hypothetical outcome plots, which really you don't need to be trying to estimate the mean of each distribution. You can just watch how often do these draws change order to get the probability of superiority. So sort of a wake up call for me in that these visualizations like POPs that I designed specifically to stop people from suppressing uncertainty were actually just being used in the same way. Um, and we were seeing these heuristics. So these results imply people are sensitive to visual cues, like the proportion of axis length that a difference spans. And these do reflect effect size, but in a garbled way. So if people are using these visual cues to infer effect size, then we should expect them to be sensitive to things like defaults in aggregating data, other factors, you know, axis scaling, all of these things that sort of define the visual frame of the plot, because people are using this to sort of reason about like, what's a plausible signal to noise ratio. So I want to jump now from visualization based inferences and how they can go badly to how visualizations can be helpful when we're explicitly considering, you know, what signal and uh, relative to noise. Whoops. So the view I'll talk about uh, briefly is um, this idea that visualizations are model checks. It's based on recognition among statisticians over the years on the connections between visualizations and statistical models. Uh, back in the 90s, for instance, Becker et al. talked about the relationship between a trellis plot and a statistical model, where the way the trellis plot is set up can correspond to testing for main effects of variables that are plotted. Here we have barley data, where points are yields. Um, the smaller rows um, that we see here, these are types of barley. Um, the bigger rows are different locations where barley um, was, was planted and measured. And then the columns are years. So the structure of the visualization sort of maximizes our chances of perceiving any main effects of these various variables. In the early 2000s, the statistician Andrew Gauman proposed the idea that a model check could unite exploratory and confirmatory analysis um, when we think about the role of visualizations there. The idea is that a good graph helps someone check one or more implicit models that they're imagining against the data. And these intuitive statistical models, even though we might not necessarily think about them or articulate them, are how graphs get meaning. So let's say I'm gonna look at a histogram. If the data are you know, remotely bell-shaped um, or bell-curve shaped, I might start thinking about comparing to a normal distribution. If it's something um, that's a little more skewed, I might think about an exponential distribution and imagine that against my data. If I'm looking at bivariate scatter plots, you know, I'm comparing implicitly um, to a straight line, um, indicating a perfect correlation. And in many ways, how well a visualization supports these implicit model checks tells us how effective the visualization is. So a lot of the, the types of uh, visualizations we see for formally checking model fit, things like QQ plots or residual plots shown here, um, sort of built into the plot, the reference distribution. So you're only looking for a deviation in symmetry in the visualization to figure out whether your, your model holds true or not. So, for instance, for a residual plot, we want to see something like the residual sort of bouncing randomly around the zero line, forming a horizontal band. This tells us that the assumptions of our model are correct. And so when we see any given residual plot, we might be expecting something like this or imagining it. 
we're sort of noting implicitly what's the deviation. So here, you know, how far off perhaps is my, my line here from vertically centered. And maybe I'm even thinking about, well, like how much deviation do I see relative to some distribution of possible or plausible amounts of deviation so I can judge, you know, how important what I've seen is. So um, we can also kind of formalize this idea by um, talking about how it's akin to a posterior predictive check in a Bayesian statistical framework. Um, but the idea is really that we're imagining reasonable data under some model that we have in mind and comparing that mentally to the data we see in a plot. Not everyone's going to do it the same way. When we use heuristics, we're not necessarily doing that at all. Um, but that's okay, because if we can begin to think about the model more specifically that we might be checking or the set of models, this might give us a way to design better graphs. Um, so how exactly will, do we do that? Um, I'll just briefly go through a few um, you know, pieces of advice. So first we can set up the visualization according to the model, of course. As I mentioned, trellis plots are great for this. Here I have self-tracker um, study data. I might care about you know, how many hours of sleep people who use this tracker um, got and how that compares to fitness levels. What's the relationship there? Uh, what they reported as their sex. I can put on the, uh, the columns here, whether they'd used sleep trackers before on the rows. And this way I can easily check for main effects of these variables. I can also go further and try to optimize this chart further so that I can see these main effects if they exist. I could add, for instance, a trend line. Um, and you can see how something like this, you know, if you imagine instead I had a single scatter plot where I used, you know, color for sex and I used shape for self uh, tracker previous use, like it would be much harder to check for these effects. Um, so that can help. Another thing we can do is think about how we, of course, scale the axes, but also how we choose other data to contextualize what we're looking for. So here, this is showing debt to GDP ratio from Ireland. Um, you know, I'm trying to judge maybe how surprising Ireland's trajectory here is. Um, and so, you know, there's other countries on this chart, and these start to imply sort of a distribution of sort of plausible, you know, slopes, and I can kind of judge what I see against that. So we should really think about these small decisions we make to set up this visual frame or this visual space, because people can rely on this then to judge, you know, what's important here. Um, so, you know, we can think about, you know, what's the implicit model when we design a chart. Um, and given that we're talking about reference distributions or, you know, I, imagining sort of simulated data, um, we can visualize uncertainty by default because this should help someone um, judge more directly how reliable any given pattern is. Um, and we can use frequency frames like uh, some of the visualizations I've shown. But even visualizing uncertainty alone won't necessarily be enough as we've seen. Um, so we, I think we should actually go further and um, as often as we can make it explicit what the predictions of the model that we think is relevant or the models are um, and show those in our visualization directly. This can remove some of these sort of mental acrobatics that we do. Um, so just to show you briefly, you know, if I added uncertainty just in a sort of conventional way, I add a confidence en envelope around um, based on the variance in the observations for each of these lines in my chart you know, suddenly I'm better off than I was without it because now I don't have to imagine sampling error. So anyone I show this to will get the same, you know, amount of error. Um, but, you know, it can also potentially be confusing. So, you know, if I were to instead to think, well, let me show uncertainty in a way that sort of suggests my model. So I'm going to present uncertainty here um, by actually running a regression on these other lines and then presenting a predictive distribution. Um, to, to sort of show the user, you know, would Ireland actually fall in this interval? It's a little clearer sort of what I'm trying to convey um, or what I think I see here as an author. And the same goes for analysis. Sometimes we need to see the explicit model predictions to make better judgments. In another recent study, you know, we looked at how well people can make causal inferences or draw causal inferences from visualizations. We showed them data on the presence of a disease among patients according to whether they had a gene thought to cause it or not, and whether they'd undergone a treatment that uh, might eliminate it. We also gave them a set of candidate models here, just a very simple set um, where they're trying to look at, you know, or use this data to judge, is it more likely that there is actually a causal effect between treatment and disease here, or is it less likely? So we gave people different visualizations. We asked them to assign probability to each uh, explanation. Some of the visualizations were interactive. We also tested just basic contingency tables, so text tables. 
But what's interesting is that while we often talk about, you know, visualizations being good for causal inference, here the visualizations did not help over a text table, uh, contingency table. In general, many people struggled to do this task, um, and these were not analysts, these were untrained people, but still, um, they, were, they were pretty bad and surprisingly bad to us. And I think one of the problems here is people didn't know what to look for. You know, we're asking them to reason about counterfactuals, we're giving them data, but there's no sort of visual support for that. So they really have to know what they're looking for. Um, so, you know, what this suggests is, well, maybe if we had directly plotted some predictions or shown them this is what it might look like under this model, you know, people could do better causal inferences from visualizations and um, we could worry less about visual analysis. Finally, final example, you know, um, Going back to the self-tracking data, you know, maybe I add my trend lines, I have my trellis plot, and then I think I see something, you know, I see a reversal in the, in the direction of the slope in one of these cells. If I could, you know, my visualization tool potentially could infer, you know, a, a model or two that might be map um, well to the structure of my plot and then show me predictions, I could also oops, um, be saved from sort of seeing, thinking that I see something that's not really there. So I think a lot of times, you know, even when we're being careful to set up plots well to check for these main effects, if we don't actually see sort of um, what we might expect, um, you know, under sort of the null model, um, it's hard to actually uh, know when we're overfitting. So I'll wrap up there, you know, um, hopefully, you know, give you a few ways to think about, you know, how might you uh, convey an implicit model in a graphic? It's not necessarily easy, but I think you know, what we see is that people are sensitive to these kind of design features, and we really have to give them more guidance than we might think. So, oops, thanks for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions if there's time. Uh, first of all, thank you for your speech. Uh, I, I would like to ask you, since you're uh, an authority in the, in the field, so do you see in the future the use of artificial neural networks, I would guess, convolutional ones? Uh, in the field, and if yes, where? Huh, I have not thought as much about that. Um, you know, visualization and machine learning are kind of coming together in various ways. You know, there's, um, you know, we can build visualization tools to try to understand the representations learned by a machine learning model like a neural network. We can also, I know there are some people doing, um, using machine learning models to try to improve visual analytics systems. I haven't thought about that as much. Um, you might ask some of my colleagues here, um, maybe Arvind has, <laughs> for instance, but yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think we wanna always be careful to stick with like, what is our actual task with the visualization? What's the inference we're trying to draw and, you know, kind of fancy, you know, ML powered backend help us with that. Um, the, what I think about more is just sort of straightforward, you know, regression modeling and, how even you know having a, uh, the ability to sort of check predictions from some some models that are not so fancy you know are 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 basically regressions of various types could be helpful. So um, I think that that's a big enough <laughs> chunk to take on relative to the way we think about visualizations a lot um, today. The visualization where you have the lines going around mm -hmm. is it how in your experience. The people looking at that, how can they see differences in mean easily? I can imagine. Yeah, so um, we did do a study once where we looked at how well they could just, you know, estimate the mean from these. And it it was surprisingly good if the variance isn't super high. Because, you know, if the, if the mean or the bar is dancing everywhere, then it's hard. Um, and there's work in vision science on like ensemble perception, which says that, you know, we're actually um, often... Uh, better than we think at extracting summary statistics from like marks laid out in space or over time. So, um, but I think, yeah, the shocker for me was that, you know, um, when we're doing something like judging effect size, you know, that visualization was really the only one that could show you sort of more directly this probability of superiority thing. And that's not, people just did not recognize how to do that. So they were doing this much more error prone judgment instead um, which really sort of, you know, I think make, make someone like me go back to the drawing board and think, you know, like, well, maybe we really have to get more creative because people can suppress uncertainty, you know, in all sorts of surprising ways. So, um, so yeah. Yeah, thanks. Our final speaker is Lais Fadilla. He's an assistant professor in the Cognitive and Information Science Department at the University of California, Merced. 
Dr. Pradilla and collaborators were recently awarded an NSF Rapid Award to study uncertainty in COVID-19 data visualizations. In 2018, she was awarded a visionary grant for research on improving trust in uncertain science funded by NASA. And in her spare time, she is a strong advocate for my minoritized groups in STEM. The NSF appointed her as a 2017-18 STEM ambassador, and she received the NSF postdoctoral award for broadening participation in STEM at Northwestern. She also recently received an APA Early Career Award. And today, she will be speaking about the impacts of COVID-19 uncertainty visualizations. All right, thank you for that introduction. I thought it'd be fun to start with an example. Here we have some COVID-19 data. We have weekly incidents of deaths in a particular area and time. And I'm specifically not telling you where this data is from or the specific time period, because I want us to try to interpret this as if we didn't know what happened in particular places. Here is the forecast, and I want you to focus your attention on this part of the figure. We have a median ensemble uh, projection right here, and this is created by the Wright Lab. They use a central repository of over 50 different forecasts from forecasting research groups, and they plot the median. So I want you to answer the question, is the COVID risk in this state decreasing, increasing, or staying the same? What do you think? And if I was to look at this, I'd say it's probably staying the same. But we can change the uncertainty visualization and add 50% confidence intervals. My interpretation is it's still probably staying the same. We're just a little less certain about that. We can bump that up to 95% confidence intervals. And all of a sudden, we're starting to see that our interpretation might be going in multiple different directions. We can also do one of my favorite approaches, which is to show some of the underlying data. What we have here is visualize the different models from the different forecasting groups. And the really impressive part of this type of technique is that our visual system, our, our mind-brain connection, has evolved to find patterns in this type of data. You might have already noticed that this distribution seems to be bimodal. And you might have also tried to find some central tendency in this distribution, which is really amazing that we can do that so intuitively and easily. And it's important to note that all of this information is completely lost in this interval-like visualization. You don't see the nuances of the distributions, which can be really important if you have to make decisions and incorporate uncertainty. Now, this visualization technique is not a very good one <laughs> in the fact that there's lots of overplotting. If you cared about any of these individual model forecasts, it'd be very hard to extract that information and, and interpret it. So what we can do is show a subset of those models. And we can select those subsets in such a way where we try to preserve the distributional information and try to convey um, the full range of possibilities. And I think something that's very interesting that Amanda talked about is this type of visualization is not abstract at all. You don't need to know anything about the uncertainty to understand that different forecasting groups made different predictions. You go to a doctor and you might get a second opinion from another doctor. That is very concrete information. It is not abstract. You don't need to know about statistics or intervals. All you have to know is that different groups make different predictions. And that, that gives you a sense of the range of possible predictions. Now, my point in showing you all of these is that if you happen to be exposed to one versus another, you might come to very different conclusions about what the COVID-19 risk to you would be. In fact, you might be pretty surprised to know in Alabama at this time, the COVID mortality deaths speak, spiked dramatically. And if you saw one of the intervals or the median forecast, that would be surprising, but maybe not so much with the multiple forecast visualization that shows you a range of possible outcomes. Now, to be clear, this one here is intended to show distributional information. Well, these ones over here summarize over that space. And we've made this distinction in other work where we've reviewed all of the modern uncertainty visualization work with Jessica Holman and Matt Kay. And one of the key distinctions we make is between summary visualizations and distributional approaches, which Jessica did a nice job of summarizing. Now I'm focusing on two types of visualizations specifically for COVID because we did a review and of these 600 visualizations that we reviewed of COVID-19 uh, data visualizations, we found that 60% use confidence intervals and just under 30% use these multiple model forecasts or multiple scenarios. But we wanted to know how to make those better and if those actually impact our decisions. So our particular question is, 
do COVID-19 influence, do COVID-19 visualizations influence our risk perceptions? And further, do some visualization techniques have more of an influence than others? It would be very important to know if one of these tools is more powerful than another for risk communicators who want to calibrate these tools in order to communicate information to the public. But what we did back in October of 2020 is we ran a study online where we showed participants different COVID-19 visualizations. And we had a whole variety of different parameters that we, we manipulated. To start, we had some controls and we showed people in California this data. And our, one of our controls was not showing uncertainty at all. We just showed historical, uh, historical mortality data. We also showed a version that had no uncertainty. It was just this mean forecast. We also had some summary visualizations that you'll all be familiar with now and some distributional approaches. The second big distinction we made is that we noticed there seemed to be something fundamentally different about these incident y-axis scaling compared to a cumulative y-axis scaling. The incident scaling calculates the deaths over a two week period and that's what's plotted. So it kind of go up and down and so forth. A cumulative scale is always going to increase because it's additive or at least kind of uh, level off. We compared these visualizations with ultimately 16 groups in this first study, and we did this work online with a population of people from Prolific. And we were able to do this in such a way where we had a representative sample that was matched to the US population in terms of age, gender, education, and income. So the results I'm going to show you are for people that generally represent the US population. Now I'm going to show you just a subset of these visualizations data that's the most interesting. Okay, so here is one visualization that shows the incident yx scaling along with a 50% confidence interval. And we can visualize the same data, but with a cumulative y-axis. And notice that the interval is teeny tiny because they're very certain that the forecast is going to increase. We can also show six expertly selected models. And the way that we selected these models is we had a forecasting expert on our group and she handpicked these models based on the underlying assumptions. Nothing about the visualization elements per se, but she made sure that the actual models themselves had minimal assumptions. And so that's what we have here. So the incident scale, this is the cumulative scale. And of course there's overplotting here. We can show all of the models from the, the central repository. It looks like this. And same thing with the cumulative scale. Okay, so what we asked people to do is make a series of judgments. For example, we asked, how often do you think each of the following people will come in contact with someone currently infected by COVID-19 in the next two weeks? They made that decision for themselves, an average 22-year-old in their state and an average 78-year-old in their state. Other questions included the likelihood of coming in contact with COVID, having adverse side effects from COVID, and the risk of hospitalization from COVID. And again, these are from participants that were online but who currently lived in California. So we had people do these risk, es risk estimates at the very beginning of the study. Then we showed them one of the visualizations for two minutes and they had to watch it, they couldn't proceed. And we had them do the same risk estimates after they saw the visualization. And our goal was to see if the visualizations changed their risk interpretations. And to be fair, that is a very tall order for visualization. At this point, this is when the country was in lockdown, people had been experiencing COVID for a while. You can imagine that your internal representation of COVID is pretty fixed for how, you, how risky you think it is to yourself and others. But we wanted to see if, if any of these visualizations can kind of move people's judgments around. And we also measured quite a variety of things about the participants, their age, gender, education, we had their COVID-19 risk factors from the CDC, how many underlying health risks they had. We had a graph literacy score, which is a measure of, of how effective they are at understanding graphs. We also had a validated measure of their COVID-19 knowledge, if they had contracted COVID or had been tested for COVID. So the results that I'm about to show you are after taking into account all of these significant factors. And to be clear, these are all very meaningful in terms of how people interpret the themselves and others. Okay, so here we have a risk rating scale from one to seven. I'm gonna show you four visualizations in the, the data from that. This is their risk ratings before they saw any of the visualizations, around a four on our risk rating scale. And this is what the data looked like after they saw these visualizations. The first thing I'll point out is that for the six models and all models, the visualizations increased their risk perception. 
suggesting that they thought they and others were at more risk after viewing this visualization than before. We did not see a meaningful impact of these visualizations for the mean and for 50% confidence interval. Okay, I plotted these dotted lines here, and these are actually the averages for all of the visualizations that I haven't yet shown you, just so you can see across the, the many visualization techniques what the averages are. And this is for the cumulative y-axis. I'm now going to show you what it looks like for the incident y-axis. We are finding no meaningful impact of these visualizations when we're using this, cumulative, or this incident y-axis, except maybe for the 50% confidence interval, people are a little uh, feeling like they're at less risk than before, but not in a, a big meaningful way. The key difference that we found, the largest effect, was comparing this cumulative y-axis to this incident y-axis. And that was surprising to us. We didn't really have a really good sense of, of why that would be. Maybe some of you saw it when I originally showed you the figure. Maybe some of you are noticing it now. It just so happened that the incident y-axis happened to be going down, the cumulative happened to be going up. If we had ran the study six weeks earlier, the, the both the cumulative and incident axes would have been going up. So we have a compound in our study. I just wanna take a moment here and say, this research is fundamentally different from any of the other work I've done before in that we thought that COVID-19 would be this unique event in human history where the entire planet was looking at data visualizations and trying to interpret them. And so we thought this was a special time where we could get a sense of how real people interpret their real risk with real data and visualizations that modified it. So we sacrificed quite a bit of experimental control to look at how people are interpreting real data. One of the controls that we sacrificed is being able to change the historical data. But what we did at this point, it was December of 2020, we, we returned to the data and we noticed that in California, both the incident and cumulative laxies happened to be going up at that time. And we looked around at the other states and noticed in New York, because they had an early spike, both the cumulative and y-axis were relatively flat at that time. So this gives us a nice opportunity to compare and contrast the different trends of, of this data. So we went ahead and we re-ran the study with people online in California and New York. And here's what that data looks like. I'll add the figures back in so you can see which ones they go to. For people in New York, we're not seeing a big impact of these visualizations at all. This is for the people who had very relatively flat uh, trends in terms of the recent peaks in, of COVID. For people in California that saw that big upward trend, that's where we're seeing the most movement here, where they're feeling they're at more risk after they view those visualizations. And importantly, we replicated our previous finding, which is that the six expertly selected model visualization tended to have the most ability to move people's judgments around significantly more than the other visualizations, which is um, very important to know if you're wanting to, uh, as a risk communicator, to kind of influence people in, in whatever way, this six model visualization might have more of a power to do that. Our big take home from this work is that these cumulative y-axis lead to less variable judgments than an incident y-axis. Problem with the incident y-axis is there's lots of things that could influence the actual trend of the data. For example, there could be a new testing site that opens and all of a sudden there's an artificial spike in the data or it's a holiday and no one's getting tested and so it goes down. So the, the initial short-term variability might be influenced by things that have nothing to do with the COVID-19 risk. We could, which could potentially be a problem. Subsequent work has replicated our finding and demonstrated that this instant y-axis actually leads to riskier, riskier um, beliefs if they're just thinking about uh, measuring risk, which is excellent. The other finding from this work and really all of my work and much of Jessica's work is that with these distributional visualizations, if you have distributional data, consider using distributional visualizations. In many ways, you are providing people with more fine-grained information and the nuance in, in the actual forecast, which could be very useful. And we've summarized this work in a variety of, of recent reviews, if you'd like to take a look at those. Um, but Jessica summarized most of them, so thank you for doing that. The big take home from this work is that visualizations of pandemic data can fundamentally change our COVID-19 risk perceptions. 
we're finding that visualizations really have a great power. And I think the visualization community is really appreciating the importance of the work and taking it very seriously, maybe in a way that we didn't um, think about before the pandemic. It's really brought it to, to center stage how important these can be. And in particular, I'm really interested in this multiple model forecast because it's a way to make uncertainty information very concrete. So we have some ongoing work that I just wanted to touch on. And what we really want to do is to think more about how to intellectually select these multiple forecast visualizations. What we did is had a forecasting expert pick them by hand. There's certainly a lot of other things that you could have done. We could have taken the best performing models from the previous week and used those. Maybe you want to show best and worst case forecasts. Maybe you want to you know, some, show something about the spread. So there's lots of choices that you have in terms of how you would go about selecting those. So here's our kind of ongoing questions that we're looking at. How should these forecasts be, be selected? What properties actually impact judgments? Ultimately, I'm really interested in how does each choice impact someone? And if we know what those key choices are, then we can use things like aesthetics and design to, to change the other types of decisions and visualizations after we know what specific judgments are influencing viewers. And this is work we just submitted, so I'm gonna give you the highlights for it. But what we're really interested in is balancing trust and task-based performance. Because you can imagine that by showing different types of representations, you might impact trust by showing potentially more of these forecast models. And that's exactly what we tested. We changed the number of forecast models. We also changed things like color and spread of these distributions to really get a sense of is that does trust and performance, is there some type of interaction there? And just to give you the two big take homes from this work, what we found is that trust and the correct COVID-19 trend prediction generally increased when you added more of these forecast models and peaked from around six to nine. When you get more than nine, you're getting a ton of overplotting. So while performance didn't drop off, it just turns into a really messy visualization where you can't discern information. So there's a sweet spot, both for trust and performance. And what we had people do is to predict what the COVID trend would be in the next two weeks. And then we would know because we, we could get the data from the next two weeks. The other thing that we found is that correct trend prediction was low for a single point-based forecast, the, the median forecast, and the 95% confidence intervals. But surprisingly, maybe not to you, but surprising to me, trust was very high for these visualizations. It was the highest across all the ones that we tested. So people really trust this simplistic information, even when their performance is worse for those. In this study, we found that the trend prediction was worse, but in the vast majority of studies, we find similar things with these confidence intervals that trust is, or that, that performance is very poor, but people trust them a great deal. And that is a very dangerous combination, high trust, bad performance. This leads me to reflect on a quote by this British philosopher. She writes, our aim, everyone's aim, is surely to trust the trustworthy, but not the untrustworthy. And there's some visualization techniques that provide us with sufficient information to be able to calibrate our trust. If we show a certain number of forecasts, at some point you're going to get a sense of the underlying number, the underlying sample, and the consistency, the agreement across different forecasters. If you mask over that information or don't show uncertainty information at all, you're not providing people with a sufficient amount of information to know how trustworthy what you're showing actually is. In addition to trust, I think it's very important to attempt to convey uncertainty in these distributions in order to get people more familiar and comfortable with uncertainty. I think that by becoming more comfortable with a range of possible outcomes, we may learn to adapt to uncertainty as a society. And I think data visualizations are part of that solution. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful talk uh, and obviously a critically important topic because the extent to which people interpret these graphs uh, changes their behavior and then changes what the future graph looks like. But so my question though is, um, without the benefit of your talk, and if I saw the multiple forecast prediction, that would lead me to decrease my trust in model estimates generally, because <clears throat> those that multiple forecasts don't show me uncertainty in the data, they show me uncertainty in the science. 
and uncertainty in the people who are trying to make predictions. And so uh, I, you know, my relatives would be tempted to just throw up their hands and say, there's just too much unknown here to make sense of it. That's a very great question. It was a huge impetus for why we actually examined trust because we thought there was something special going on with trust in these. And so we, um, in the study I didn't show you all the results for, we had people give us their strategies and in these kind of complex text boxes. And we hand coded 1500 strategies to look for exactly that. And there was some portion of people who thought that when there was more forecasts, there was, it was about model disagreement and uncertainty in, in the system. But the larger proportion of people felt that what we are seeing ac across these different forecasts were simply groups that had different initial conditions, different model assumptions. And so they felt that by seeing the different um, types of forecasts that the groups would make, there uh, increased the robustness of the overall forecast. So there certainly is two groups of people um, that interpret these in different ways. The larger proportion of people find more of these models to be trustworthy, but there is an important group that does not. So that's a, that's a good point. Okay. So this is really more about the, the link between language and graphic, um, which for me was embedded in your talk. So you, um, uh, you found that people were, I'm not sure I'm going to paraphrase it correctly, but uh, more accurate or more trustworthy with the cumulative incidents, with the cumulative plots. But your questions in the survey were about incidents. They were about what do you think is going to happen to you in the next week or few days? So those are questions that the statistician would say, oh, I need to look at the incident plot because the cumulative incident plot is going to have smoothed out everything and it's going to be very hard for me to detect change in that slope. I want the incident plot because it is the best predictor of what's going to happen in the near term. So why did you pose incident questions? Well, to, to be clear, when we, in that original study, we were just asking about risk perceptions. And I think that um, the big take home is not necessarily accuracy because I don't know how risky someone, what their, what their true risk is. There's no true right answer for what your risk is and what the next person's risk is. We're really looking at how these visualizations moved around decisions. Um, so for that reason, we thought it was appropriate to interpret um, a comparison between incident and cumulative. And to be clear, the finding was not that, that uh, the cumulative was better, it was that it was more stable. The incident axis was very, um, dependent on the on the trend, which which makes sense if if you are uh, using that trend to calibrate your judgment. So I, I I appreciate the question, and it's hard to answer because we didn't have a sincere correct answer. So I don't know if the correct answer was really an incident task based correct answer or if it's more complex than that. Thank you. Thanks for the fantastic work. Um, I have a question that maybe will tie it back to some of the themes that Alvita brought up at the beginning of the symposium on uh, personal differences. And so I know with California and New York, maybe there won't be any diversity to my question. You can guess where I'm going. Um, but I was wondering if anything around like political affiliation or um, information diet or anything else may have also had an effect in terms of perceived risk in the reading of these visualizations or any of the other individual differences that might be, you might have some insight into? Yeah, it definitely could have. So we did control for um, graph literacy, um, COVID knowledge. That's really why we measured that. It's because we thought maybe some states would have different amounts of familiarity with COVID information, but certainly there could be many others. That's the challenge of, it, it, they are two different populations. They, it's um, maybe a false comparison to, to directly compare them. Um, but certainly there could have been other things and- Or even within state, if there was a um, conditional distribution to things. Yeah, so I would say um, there, there was differences for gender and age and the almost all of those um, bullet pointed items I had meaningfully impacted individuals risk perceptions. We didn't check if there was bimodal distributions within those. So it could have been that there was different groups of people. Um, yeah, that is something we 
we could definitely dig more into because we have so much data now <laughs> with all of those measures. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> so we do have one question from the virtual audience. Has there been any research or graphical confirmation of the extent to which the previous forecasts were in line with the reality? The, so the accuracy of the forecast itself, is that the question? Not sure. <laughs> okay. I'm, so I'm not that familiar. So the, the stuff that I have seen is that the particular types of ensemble forecasts that the Reich Lab is using, um, a few papers have come out suggesting that those are the most reliable. And the way that they do that is they take, I think it's the 10 best performing model from their repository of 50 and use that to, to create a median. But there's a lot of ongoing work to try to increase the uh, predictive accuracy of the, the forecast themselves. Um, the, the issue is that they are, they are not very sensitive to short-term fluctuations, which of course, you know, um, some uh, models with particular assumptions happen to get it right based on their assumptions. So it's, it's a little tricky to compare um, individual models with individual assumptions to an ensemble, but ultimately they tend to be very stable over time. Thank you. <laughs> I think that's it. All right, thank you. All right, well, thanks everybody. Let's thank all our speakers one more time. And um, keep an eye out for our next symposium, which will hopefully happen not too far away. <laughs>